I deliver this recording in what I believe will be the final hour of my life. I can only hope that when this message reaches home, it will be heard and taken with the utmost seriousness. My name is Galexin. I am, or was, the commander of the 4th Piration Band. And I know my world has heard of me. For years, our pirates have raided worlds and trade routes with impunity. I am sure this part will be censored when or if it is broadcast successfully to our population. But I want to say it anyway. We acted as agents of the Governing Council. With their permission, both tacit and explicit, depending on where we were going and who we were attacking. Sometimes, I admit, we struck at places outside of the concerns of our government, and of course, since it was outside of their concerns, who cared? Screams can be heard in the background. Forgive me. The smoke is starting to make its way in. It won't be long now. I will be quick. We raided Terra because it was easy, and because the race seemed weak. I mean, whoever heard of a species of intelligence sacrificing mature and productive adults for their young, when they not only can just make more, but enjoy doing so at every opportunity, when they first ventured into interstellar space and made contact with our enemies, it's probable that they had no idea that the invitation to join a trade alliance was an invitation to be invaded. But once they did, hey, easy pickings, right? No grand military fleet, no massive space stations or networks of defenses. They had only begun to draw up plans to harvest the energy of the stars en masse. Like I said, easy. So we hit the place, a few capitals, blew up some bases. Oh, we had a grand old pirate time, as we always have. And we put ourselves in reach, which was one of our biggest mistakes. We took communities easily enough at first. But then one of our people during a harvest grew annoyed at the sound of a crying infant of their species. They have a horrific wail, so he shot it in the arms of what we now know was one of their females. No big deal, just make another, right? We thought wrong. The woman lost all reason and attacked our raiders. She was shot 16 times, but she beat one of us to death with his own weapon. That was when we found the other thing out. Humans tell stories. A lot. This story, well, they recorded it. Evidently, they record a lot. And the sight of one of our officers killing one of their infants in its mother's arms, and then her beating him to death with his own weapon before she was finally killed, too, sparked an outbreak of violence that cost me four companies in a day. Then, one of my idiot officers decided that since they love children so much, we would threaten to kill more of them if they didn't stand down. Big mistake. He showed them that we were kitty-killing monsters. And when humans decide that something is dangerous to their young, they will stop at nothing to destroy it. There's gunfire. Screams cut short. The sound of humans shouting beyond the door. You have to understand. It isn't just my band. They've decided our entire race is a threat to their young. The last interceptions we made of their communications showed that the Keelan Confederation was going to trade them weapons and technology to join the war in earnest. We picked up home communications. The whole planet has gone mad with hatred for us. Steal their goods, nobody cares. Kill an adult, they get upset. But kill their young, and they lose all reason or care for their own lives. If they have any sense of self-preservation left when it comes to wiping us out, I can't find it. I tried negotiating. I tried trading. I tried warning and threatening them, and all that meant was that their convictions were hardened. Whatever you do, do not target their young. You'll doom us all. We thought that would make things easy, and we thought wrong. Human shouts intensify. Scream of pain, then silence. And that is the last report of the most powerful pirate fleet commander in the last 500 cycles. Since that time, humans have exterminated four military bases and done self-termination runs against entire fleets, crippling operations in 14 quadrants. I am afraid the war is as good as lost. Therefore, I recommend we offer terms to the Keelan Confederation that are favorable to peace, including a mandate that they cease to supply humans with weapons and technology. In addition, in the post-war period, I move that we propose to the Galactic Union that we make it unlawful to employ human mercenaries or to supply weapons to human armies, and make it a war crime to target human young in any operation under any circumstances.
Perhaps news of that will help them realize that we are not all the same as the late pirate lord. Will that work? Many voices ask the question. How much longer? Everybody asks that question. North America, South America, Eastern Europe, Asia, the Indian subcontinent. Everywhere there was a story of one of the pirate band that raided humanity executing someone's infant for being loud. So the question, how much longer, kept coming. The Keelan Confederation's ships were tracked on the global net. Their first transmissions of technological data for interstellar travel had already been given to every government on Earth. Every session of the United Government that began to form in the wake of the stories and videos began the same way. The sound of a crying child, a shot from a pirate weapon, and a mother's screams. And only then would humans debate. It was played in the new shipyards that were already being built. It was being played in the United Infantry Training Grounds that sprung up around the world. It was being played in the mech construction factories and training centers. And every day, new reports about their preparations were sent to the Keelan Confederation government. And that same question, how much longer, began to haunt the Confederation itself, because with it, their monitoring of Terran communications came more of their cultural exchange information, stories, songs, poetry, movies, histories, and it was days before the first transport ships were due to arrive on Earth. Their horror movies are concerning, the chief anthropologist remarked. He stroked his scales in a nervous gesture, shedding some of the dead flecks to the floor. Not the alien invasion movies, a politician asked with a huffing noise that passed for laughter. Those too, but not for the reason you think. The problem is that every alien invasion and every horror movie monster is so over the top it is utterly ridiculous. Monsters that are immortal, or ghosts that can't die, things like that. Or aliens with such impossible technology that they defy the laws of physics. The chief anthropologist replied, his reptilian tail lashed at his back as his anxiety grew worse. Why is that so concerning? the politician asked because that is the only thing in the universe they consider to be a threat. It has to be gods or angels or demons or impossible monsters or impossible aliens. Anything less than that, they don't consider it reasonable to feel afraid of. If it can't break a planet, it isn't a problem they're worried about. You heard what they did to the admiral of the pirate fleet, didn't you? He was basically a lord they tore his limbs off. Eventually. The chief anthropologist shuddered. I tell you, sir, I've never seen a species this insanely protective of their young. The father of one of the boys dragged one of the pirates to death behind a two-wheeled motorized contraption and handed over only shreds of flesh to our ambassador when we asked what happened. They're insane, and they're now convinced that our enemies want to kill their children. The chief anthropologist held out his hands with finger claws upturned. We may just be inviting disaster unless we tread carefully. I understand we need the reinforcements, but this species is the most homicidal, suicidal, bloodthirsty species I've ever come across. One of their stories has their literal god coming down, pissing some of them off, and they nail him alive to wood to die. My assistant went there on a visit and... He chewed on his tongue for a moment. And what? The politician asked. He was assigned to study their military culture to see how it distinguishes from the rest of their castes, only to find that they have no castes. Anyone can fulfill any role they want. He asked one of their pilots how they'd take down a jamming ship that kept AI from piloting things, and he said just blow up the jamming ship. My assistant pointed out that you can't do that because the signal would be jammed, and the pilot said that it didn't matter as long as you just used a living pilot instead. The chief anthropologist shuddered. The politician shrugged. Grossly exaggerated, I'm sure. I know some of my colleagues are bothered by this, but as long as they can help us win, I fail to see the problem. The chief anthropologist could only walk away in defeat, leaving a nervous trail of shed skin behind him. Three months later, let the humans take the casualties. The Keelan admiral said, they're asking for the first run. It was a request that was happily granted. The Keelan-provided starships were piloted by humans, but they were not piloted like Keelan pilots intended. The Admiral watched with dismay as fighters skipped like smooth stones over the atmosphere of the planet 
and sent out a transmission audible to both sides, unencrypted. Does anybody have a translation for yippee ki yay motherfucker? The admiral asked, heads shook. In contradiction to doctrine, the longships bounced along the atmosphere, confusing ground defenses and unleashed withering fire on the planetary defenses. Again, contradicting doctrine, which said that ground troops should only come down after the area was secure, the human piloted ships were coming in fast and descended at dangerous speeds as soon as they were able to breach the atmosphere of the world. Some sense of foreboding or hope or uncertainty or something he could not truly name compelled him to his next orders. Put the surface on screen, the admiral barked, and broadcast this back home. The screen came up and showed the transports opening up and the human jumpers emerging from the bottom of the transports. Humans are machines, he asked, and his crew shrugged it off. That was when the second broadcast hit. The sound of some wailing, a familiar sound of a weapon going off, and the scream of a human woman. This broadcast was as unencrypted as the rest and clearly intended to be heard by all, and it seemed to drive the humans mad. Then he saw the flesh pilots and the human love of overkill. The machines the humans piloted were heavy lumbering things with massive arms equipped with guns mounted with projectile weapons the size of a body. Contemporary strategy involved capturing positions, but the human heavy infantry had no interest in capturing positions. Each of their mechs had mounted rockets on both shoulders, dozens of small ones that were launched at any building in their path. The Pankin Alliance had soldiers aplenty, but they fought as if they wished to live. The humans fought as if they were there to kill and didn't care if they died in the process. The first transports holding secondary light infantry began to land moments after their mechanized walkers. These used light rocket-powered air sleds that shot over the battlefield. These lightly armored soldiers sprayed chaff everywhere to cripple the laser-based weapons of the surviving defenders, the white mist wreaking havoc on their ability to resist. This isn't war. This is revenge. Are they insane? Are they insane? The admiral asked the question twice and still got no answer. Whoever controlled the monitor began to zoom in on the close fighting and saw the twisted mask of hatred on the Terran face of a light infantryman. His projectile weapon's sharp gleam at the front suddenly had a clear purpose. They put knives on guns! The admiral half stammered as the Terran infantryman gutted the Pankin Alliance soldier, shouting in rage as if it had been his own young to be killed by the pirates. The admiral tried to imagine. From what twisted depths of the abyss can hate like that come from? What is he thinking about? Doesn't he know what he's doing? Is he a machine? He whispered his exclamation. Sir, we have an incoming transmission from the Terran Admiral, the officer said without tearing his eyes away from the screen, while the screen zoomed out and showed a battle-mad Terran pick up a severed arm and beat an unfortunate to death with it. What, what is he saying? The Admiral asked. He's saying that we're unnecessary, the Pankin turned out not to be as fierce as he was led to believe. The officer on comms and translations waited for his admiral to answer, but as they saw the Terran banner raised over the last standing building and the human infantry and mechanized forces set fire to the last Pankin stronghold in the area and shoot down those who were trying to flee, the admiral could not argue. Tell him, it's fine. We'll take the next world when we leave next month. The admiral responded. His comms and translations officer relayed that, and then his scales began to shed horribly. They're not waiting, sir. He says, follow with supplies, but the next world is only one jump away and not ready. He didn't use many supplies, so we can follow when we're ready. Weeks later at the Keelan Confederacy Assembly. Fourteen worlds in fourteen months. The war's progress has completely reversed itself. The Pankin are offering terms of surrender, some strange ones, some that I can understand. But there is another question we have to ask. Will the humans be willing to make peace? The assembly heard the question asked by their revered speaker, and they were silent. The transmissions sent out by the various fleets of human military operations ranged from the insane to the astonishing. They were rapidly becoming known across galactic civilizations as the war apes.
and they were beginning to appear in popular media and propaganda regarding the changing fortunes of the war. The once slow and inevitable defeat was rapidly turning into a total victory, but Terran rage at the Pankin had not abated, and it was growing concerning. Will they fight without allies? Someone asked, and that brought a general round of laughter. Daring solo operations by human officers were as much a routine as sunrises now. They are not a totally irrational species. If we offer to make it a war crime galaxy-wide to ever harm their young under any circumstances, and to immediately hand anyone who does so over to the Terran government for trial and disposal, they might recognize the value of this and make peace with the Pankin along with the rest of us, the revered speaker suggested. Will that really be enough for them? It was a reasonable question. We think so, the revered speaker said, and then moved to take a vote. Ah, ambassador, to what do I owe the pleasure? The Terran ambassador, a faintly whitish male with almond eyes from a region the Terrans identified as Japan, asked and gave a polite half bow on the video screen. The Terran face was absurdly expressive compared to the reptilian scale face of a Kalanian, but once you got used to it, it was almost graceful. As a species, they confused Ambassador Kalpek. They could be very gregarious, open, and friendly to a degree that was at first off putting to the Kalanian race but the openness of the culture had made it easier to deal with them than most Confederation members when it came to trade. Then there was the matter of the war with the Pankin Alliance. The vengefulness of the humans who rampaged like monsters unleashed became the main focus of propaganda to revitalize the war effort. But now, after a string of victories that saw the various member races of the Pankin Alliance surrender, only the Pankin remained, and they were done. I'm presenting marvelous news. The Pankin have offered to surrender. We wanted to invite you to the negotiations regarding terms. Kalpek trailed off and his tail twitched as the human ambassador's face changed to lose all expression. Are their conditions unconditional, Ambassador? Ambassador Nobunaga asked. Well, no, Ambassador Kalpek replied. Then we aren't finished with them yet, Ambassador Nobunaga replied. But we can negotiate. Kalpek started to say until the human held up a hand to stop him. You may feel free to negotiate all you like, but we are not done with them yet. When they offer unconditional surrender, then we will dictate terms to them. They raided our homes, killed our children. Terran policy is to never negotiate with the aggressors. A surrender to you means nothing to us. The ambassador's smile returned. But we can negotiate good terms and we aren't done. Nobunaga cut the transmission, and Kalpek hissed. I told the Pankin it wouldn't work. All that is left is to die out or surrender completely. He muttered, then thought. On the other hand, having these maniacs on our side completely upsets the balance of power in the galaxy in the Confederation's favor. Yes, I think this will work out fine, as long as we craft a rational policy. Two months later. The Pankin Empire, the precursor to the Pankin Alliance which had bullied twenty-odd races into submission, had its foundation on a trio of systems with nine worlds each, all of which had been either habitable or easily Pankiformed to suit their desires many generations earlier. These twenty-seven planets comprised the industrial, spiritual, economic, and political heart of their empire. As world after world crumbled and the terms of peace were constantly rejected, they grew ever more desperate. They understood the Confederation, but they had not understood the Confederation's newest member. They did not know their enemy. Some might argue that they could not have known their enemy, and that ignorance brought them ever closer to defeat, until all that remained were the three core systems. The war apes had no interest in preserving, occupying, or protecting anything on those worlds. While they had shown mercy to subordinate races, Pankin were slowly pushed toward extinction. We are offering terms of surrender. Tell us when you offer unconditional surrender. The Terrans always replied and then cut the transmission. Going through their Confederate enemies was a desperate gamble to find some terms other than unconditional. And now, two months after that debacle, Three core worlds had been glassed clean of major cities. Major sea lanes had been mined with self-replicating magnetic mines, and all energy supply points were utterly eliminated. 
World after world teetered on the brink of returning to a hunter-gatherer state to survive it all. Still, the Pankin fought on. They raised smaller, more mobile ships and proclaimed that nobody can fight forever, that if they just continued, the Terrans would give them something. The Terrans continued to give the Pankin glassed worlds. Within four more months, the Confederation was begging their allies, Stop! And by then, three worlds remaining that had not been ruined, including the Pankin homeworld. Ambassador Nobunaga went personally to the Confederation homeworld for the conference. The Pankin ambassador appeared on the screen. His own white scales were cracked. Shreds of skin that hadn't properly shed from the stress held out his finger claws with desperation. If we surrender unconditionally, what will you do with us? The entire Confederation listened with rapt attention. I will tell you what we will not do. The Terran said, and I tell you that only so you know we never intend this for anyone. We will not make your race into slaves. We will not take your religions. We will not occupy any world that still has an intact occupation. We will not slaughter what is left of you. You can even keep your government. They were not exactly terms in the traditional sense. It was a list of will-nots which still revealed more mercy for the Pankin than any Terran had shown thus far. The Great Council was filled with seats of full-time resident races, avian, reptilian, feline. Among others were many, even a species that looked similar to Terrans in their apish flesh bodies. But all were set to muttering with some degree of relief. Then we surrender. Unconditionally. Just please. Stop. The Pankin hissed and went down to his knees. It was not a traditional Pankin gesture, but it was one the other ambassadors who had consumed abundant Terran media would recognize as intended for a Terran audience. Then we have peace. Here are the terms. The Pankin are prohibited space travel for the next 100 years. Their remaining worlds will be converted to agrarian industry only and those worlds we have left in Pankin hands which still have living populations will be open up to immigration to all members of the Confederation. But with the first land and territory pick going to Terrans, for the first five years where years are understood to mean the duration of time on those worlds. In addition, the Pankin remaining worlds will be liable to a 20 trillion credit war indemnity to be provided to our military veterans, government, and the families of those children your pirates slew. Ambassador Nobunaga laid out the terms that the Earth government had settled on, and the tale of the Pankin ambassador stiffened as if he had died and undergone rigor mortis. It wasn't hard to understand why. With those terms, the Terrans will have taken the best spots of every world in some of the richest systems, and utterly crippled the Pankin homeworlds for generations to come. With no space travel, and an agrarian economy, they are essentially prisoners on their own worlds. And as for the survivors on the other worlds, after most of them starve to death thanks to ruined supply chains, they'll be a tiny minority. With the high populations of humans occupying the top spots and the Confederation's people following hot on their heels, they may just beg for flights back to their intact worlds. And just like that, the Terran Empire has been born. We submit, the Pankin said, his face down, his entire body a broken-souled husk of its former self, as he lived to see the fall of his once mighty empire. I know, Nobunaga replied, then turned around to face the Confederation. Now we are done with them. Now we maybe we can all live in and enjoy the fruits of peace. With two-way transmissions from Earth, the polite applause of the Confederation was drowned out by the cheers of the entire Terran homeworld. I hope we didn't make a terrible mistake, Ambassador Kalpek thought as the cheers went on. Over the next five years, Pankin society collapsed on the worlds where they still had survivors. Devoid of both the infrastructure and the knowledge of how to survive outside of a modern world, the Pankin of countless worlds fell to turning their weapons on one another wiping out entire populations of survivors until they ran out of modern weapons, then resuming the process with whatever they could. They no longer had the means for even medieval-level societies in most worlds, and were reduced to hunter-gatherer scavenging, some never knowing the fates of their homeworlds, or that peace had come at last. All finding out the same way. Humans. 
The victors in the brutal war touched down and began to settle the most ideal parts of the world and convert it from Pankinian arid climates to the sorts of worlds favored by humans. The Pankin who spied these new structures either begged or fled, but they were too broken to actually fight. And even if they hadn't been, hunter-gatherer societies do not always eat well. The races of the victorious confederation were quick to address the matter of what would happen to the Pankin. We would like to send observers and scientists to study how they've adapted to the social change and ensure they are not brutalized in the aftermath of the victory. The Terran government heard several forms of that request independently. They say the victory, not our victory and not your victory. I suppose I can't blame them for that. Grand Presider Jackson thought as he watched the view screen, one of the avian species made it this time. He was quick to answer, Of course you are free to do so, but we expect most survivors to request to be relocated to their home system. They will not be happy living under us, I think. However, you are free to observe them for a few months as our colonies are established. A transmission came in as soon as that one was disconnected. This one directly from the official representative of the Keelan, the first human ally, and perhaps the closest and most liked by humanity as that race had given humans technology and travel capability in the aftermath of the Pankin pirate attack on Earth. Grand Presider Jackson stroked his dark beard. The transmission hadn't been accepted yet because he knew what the Kalanian was likely to ask. He took a deep breath. We can't keep this secret for long enough to matter. It's better that we come clean now. He swallowed. The question of how humans were colonizing worlds so quickly was bound to come up. He hit the green accept button, and the pale lizard man's naturally severe face came on screen. Grand Presider of the Terran Ascendants, I hope you're well. Great Speaker of the Keelan Empire, I am, and I hope the same for you. The two leaders bowed slightly in their seats. Despite their differences in species, they had common ground that made it easy to get along quite well. It didn't hurt that the Keelan had none of the prejudices that had still existed, though slowly continued to die out in Jackson's youth over the color of his skin. The existence of aliens more advanced than humans made that absurd outlook even more marginalized, and the Pankin murders of children regardless of all other factors buried what was left of it. If anyone still thought that way, they were quiet enough about it that Grand Presider James Stoneworth Jackson expected it would die when age and time took them. I am also, the Keelan Great Speaker replied. Forgive me if I bypass our usual pleasantries. I'm afraid I have an important question for you. You want to ask about our colonization rate? The Grand Presider asked. Yes. You've placed 20 outposts on over 20 different worlds in the last few months. There is some concern about whether or not your planet can handle the kind of mass emigration it would take to sustain that. The Keelan question was clearly carefully constructed to be benign, even with good reason. Not to worry, great speaker. You, my world, has had many mass migrations in the past. We've learned a great deal about how to handle it, and our current solutions are quite effective. Grand Presider Jackson promised and he was unable to constrain a smile when he said it. Our study of your species has shown, strangely enough, that you put abundant resources into few young over a long period of time. This is strange to us who think nothing of losing a few along the way, but it seems this should make things harder, not easier for you. The great speaker replied, and James Jackson politely inclined his head. Yes, but our children are capable of a great deal at a relatively early age, so we've adopted two strategies. Our facilities on those worlds are cloning from our vast stores of DNA here at home. Our colonies will then have workers maintaining the minor infrastructure, while others will raise and educate the cloned population. If we repeat the process every ten years, and each parental set raises five children, and then, as adults, they plus their parents do five more. The Grand Presider let the sentence fall away. The great speaker was no mathematician, but he didn't need to be. Exponential population growth, he said. His eyes ticked a little. Yes, of course we'll continue to send supplies, and the billions in credits the Pankin will pay will help support buying what we need from our closest allies. Grand Presider Jackson let that sentence hang as he had the one before, 
and silence passed between the two leaders. The next question was totally benign. Aren't you concerned about the possible problems that might occur from that? What about when people from worlds meet, the possibility of incest and the like? The nictating membranes of the Keelan Confederation leader's eyes had picked up their pace. Grand Presider Jackson kept his smile calm. We are aware of the possibility, but the risk is very low compared to the reward of having a hundred or so viable colonies in a relative handful of years, and it isn't anything that can't be solved without simple mandatory DNA testing to ensure a lack of relation. Then within a few generations, the many populations will be sufficiently different through our relatively quick pace of mutation that it will cease to be anything but a curiosity. Great Speaker Kalin did not remain on the line with the Terran presider for much longer. Nor, however, did he bring his findings to the other leaders. In 20 years, they'll have fully functional colonies. In 40, they will be self-sufficient and begin exporting finished goods of their own. In a hundred they'll have an empire larger than the entire confederation combined. The thought was sobering at best. The worlds of the former Pankin were good ones, but they were far from the only ones. However, most colonies were planned for generations before finally established. Emigration was slow for most races, but Terrans seemed to go mad for exploration. Phrases like first and Kilroy was here were found burned into moons on uninhabited systems, and rogue colonists were already settling outlying places or venturing off into the unknown, where most likely they would die. But who knows what we'll find out there one day, he asked himself. Adaptable and clever, the Terrans who went rogue and off into the void might survive or even thrive. He walked away from the electron spin communication relay and saw the book that lay on his table. Terran books were becoming popular commodities, but because they were heavy, bulky physical media, most simply got them as electronic documents, but this one was a gift. The title was from one of their most popular authors of the 21st century and part of a large series. Who Endures, about a woman who built an empire to save the one she loved and burned an empire to avenge the ones she lost. Was he warning me, educating me? No, that can't be. It's just a gift. Enough waiting. I have to explain this to the others, he told himself and then went to do exactly that, while trying not to wonder what kind of fleets a hundred human worlds might muster up in another hundred years. Grand Presider James Stoneworth Jackson shook hands with his replacement. After three four-year terms, and two of the customary recall options overwhelmingly rejected, his term of service was over. In front of him, the pale hand of Madison Maxwell closed in a tight grip. The former war hero's silver artificial eye gleamed in the morning light as cheers echoed all over not just world, but on forty worlds of the Terran ascendancy. The two men posed shoulder to shoulder and waved to the video relays for several minutes before Presider Jackson took to the podium for the final time. When I began my term of service, humanity faced a threat like no other, and it is not my accomplishment, but humanity's accomplishment that we won through in the end. The ones to cruelly slay our children in their mother's arms are reduced to trading crops from their home worlds. Their empire is ashes and memory, and ours stands in its place. We took our place among the stars, touched the face of God, and thumbed the eyes of the devils of the abyss. Now, my time is done, and you have chosen a worthy successor. I wish him all the success in all the worlds. Grand Presider Madison Maxwell, the podium is yours. The burly former commander inclined his head, and as Grand Presider Jackson stepped aside, Grand Presider Maxwell's leathery hands gripped the podium, in contrast to the studious academic-looking Jackson, whose ebony skin was contrasted by the early whitening of his hair through the strain of office. He was thin, a far cry from his more robust beginnings. Terrans, I prepared to fight the Pankin before the war. I fought them throughout the war, and I oversaw the resettlement of the last of them after the war. Now I, with your full faith and confidence, will do my best to guide us through a new struggle. We are not one world anymore, we are many, but we remain one people. We are spread over many worlds and will spread to many more, and great challenges and hard questions await us. We showed our bravery in war, now we must show our honor in peace light years away. 
It seems bizarre to replace a competent leader with a new one. High Lord Avon remarked, his feathers ruffled a little bit. The other Goslinian leaders bobbed their heads forward, their own feathers similarly ruffled. Yes, but Galen insists this is routine for them, and their popular media seems to confirm it, the Secretary of the Interior remarked. Understanding did not make his feathers ruffle less. It seems to work. They try out so many new ideas. They come to solutions far faster than any species we've encountered before. Throwing out what doesn't work and embracing what does, they seem wild, unpredictable. The fleet admiral didn't just bristle his feathers. Several fell away to drift down to the floor, becoming dark marks on the white stone floor. And powerful. High Lord Avon finished the words for his Grand Marshal. Of the forty worlds they've already settled, ten are now self-sustaining. Their routine of cloning and taking small numbers to raise large ones, repeated several times around those worlds, has seen their populations rise exponentially. Two hundred thousand will raise five each, and then another round of clones later, and then within a handful of years they have a sustainable population to spread out over the world. The remaining thirty worlds will get the same treatment. In fifty years, all 117 Pankin worlds will be occupied. The Pankin space that remains will be surrounded. When they can venture out into space again, if they ever can, they will do so as the supplicants of humans. He folded his taloned fingers together and looked around his inner cabinet members, every feather ruffled. What does that mean for the rest of us? He asked, his beak opened and closed without making a sound, and the trade minister spoke up. It means we have a vast new market open up to us. Twenty of their worlds are two warp jumps away. They're an ideal market for our traders, and we have precedency by proximity in negotiations. Piracy is also nearly non-existent for now, which means our long suspicions of Pankin's sponsorship and support for pirates must have been true after all. Angry cause filled the room. Sympathy for the Pankin plight declined considerably. I propose we move our fleet away from human worlds, take them galactic east where tensions are higher. The massives have been more demanding. A show of force might be in order, the Grand Marshal proposed. Plus, it might show the new empire we have faith in them as allies and help our negotiations enough to allow some of our young to migrate to their worlds. What have they done with the defeated races of the Pankin Alliance? Are they exterminated? It was a weighty question from the High Lord and the foreign minister spoke up. Having seen the humans exterminate Pankin en masse before, it was widely wondered how they would treat the weaker races of the Alliance once they'd been defeated. None of them had more than a handful of worlds, so the human penchant for destruction would have risked their extinction. Allowed to surrender and left alone, but prohibited expansion, they are, however, allowed to travel within Terran space as long as their ships are not armed. That is more generous than I would have expected. Are you sure of this information? High Lord Avon pressed, and the flexible neck of the foreign minister bobbed up and down immediately. This comes straight from Gielan observers, and I have seen the treaty copies. Their now former leader was quite canny. Mercy to the ones dragged to the fight, brutality toward the ones who started it. A good way to deplete the enemy of allies. Now I don't think anyone will challenge them. Not for quite some time. It was a relief when the rest of his cabinet bobbed their heads in agreement. Nobody will do anything stupid, so everything will be fine. The High Lord breathed a sigh of relief and called for new business. It's a dangerous universe out there, High Lord Avon said through his translator to the new human Grand Presider. You defeated the Pankin Alliance, but don't forget that we fought with you to achieve that. Your race grows, expands, be proud. But the universe snacks on galaxies. All the peace we now have is dependent on balance. There are other empires, some of them very old. Please exercise care to not provoke them. You're saying this because I was one of the soldiers of the last war, I assume? Grand Presider Maxwell asked. He opened his hands at his sides in a gesture that briefings told the Goslian leader he was presenting himself with openness. I am. A warrior is a warrior, no matter where he is born. But we never put warriors in charge in times of peace. That your species does, I will not lie to you. It is a matter of some concern. It suggests to the Keelan Confederation that your race prizes war more than peace. 
High Lord Avon said, his feathers remained unruffled. Thus far, the swarthy-looking human with the false eye had given no words indicating anything but peaceful intent. High Lord Avon, how much have you studied our race and its history? Grand Presider Maxwell asked in a quiet, almost gentle voice. Not as much as I wanted. Work keeps me busy. But I have seen some of your popular books, such as that 21st century author, his story about the slave and the prince who shaped the fate of empires by passion and brutality. The strongest in the world, I believe it was called. A riveting story. Why do you ask? Because the history of humanity is one of war, with peace being the mere break between two great conflicts. The Pankin brought us to leave our world, and we have had the first war. It is inevitable that a second will at some point bring about the bracket on the other side. But I was not chosen to fight it. I was chosen to make my people strong enough to win it. Humanity always desires peace. In peace, our children are safe. In peace, we can trade and study and explore and prosper. But the Pankin taught us that the universe is just a larger version of our own world. If it weren't, you would not have admirals and fleets of your own. The Grand Presider said it as reasonably as he could. He even wore a smile, which horrified High Lord Avon all the more. Preparing for war is just as natural as breathing. The High Lord realized, predatory species among the Confederation and the other independent worlds and alliances that dotted the galaxy as he knew it. They weren't rare, but the most common were social sedentary ambush predators. Their intelligence evolved to make hunting prey easier with less work. Active predatory species rarely evolved into higher intelligence, instead favoring strength or speed or a few built-in weapons as part of the body. They evolved from active predators. There's no other explanation. What disaster in the universe selected intelligence for intelligent social behavior? How did they not wipe themselves out before we encountered them? The open question would merit asking the anthropology experts which sprang up amidst the xenobiologists in the last few years. Thanks to widespread media from Earth, the science divisions went utterly wild for the chance to study the new member species that broke all the rules they knew. The widely held theory of intelligence selection and evolution had for the first time in generations not only been challenged, but was now in the process of being overturned as more information on the Homo sapiens sapiens species came to light. The theory held that selection for creative problem-solving intelligence that would result in the emergence of sapience and sentience in a species, required three things, a predatory nature, a social nature, and an ambush or sedentary nature. This allowed longer settlement, safer predation, and slower expansion that kept the genetic mutations selecting for a smarter and smarter population of predators. Now, the humans showed otherwise. So when the call ended on an amicable note, the High Lord summoned his foreign advisor along with the foremost expert in xenobiology's newest branch, anthropology. Polite introductions aside, the old Goslian's feathers had fallen out in places revealing the pink flesh that was similar in color to the Terran Grand Presider. It was off-putting at the least to see the cracked beak of a Goslian not long for life. And yet despite his slow, bobbing, walking gait, he seemed full of life when he spoke. High Lord, you wanted me to brief you on the humans, I assume? The old Goslian asked. And to this, the High Lord bobbed his head and sat down. Yes, their current leader is not what I expected, but he is a bit defensive. Just a bit. But as they're continuing to expand into the old Pankian space and will be our second largest border people, I need the best advice possible. That can only come from you, though I know it hasn't been that long, please. Do your best. The High Lord spoke with deference to the aged professor, and the old one sat when a chair was placed opposite the desk. To begin, I want to explain my theory on why they evolved intelligence. I sought information from their scientists on their own theory of evolution and found something remarkable. Roughly 200,000 years ago, environmental shift nearly wiped their ancestors out. The genetic bottleneck shows that this species is descended from an absurdly small population, roughly 5,000 strong scattered over an entire continent that was hemmed in by a desert. They were omnivorous, but they were walking predators, simply put. A trained human can run for an entire day, 
as well as drink and eat on the run. Their species would walk prey to death. The old one stopped as the High Lord's feathers bristled outward. So their long battles that wore out the Pankin's best defenses, he asked, the fruit of near extinction. Simply put, when a species is near extinct, the slow pace of evolution is accelerated because there are fewer members reproducing successfully. And in this case, their near extinction during the climate shift resulted in a selection for intelligence and creativity. They were already social and predatory. But when under the strongest possible selection pressure that didn't quite drive them to extinction, their smartest diffused their most intelligent traits into the small population. And thus, the old professor shuddered. Excited as he was, the implications were not lost on him. The High Lord finished the statement. We end up with war apes who can go all day long where other races simply drop from exhaustion. It's quite exciting. I never thought I'd live to see a revolution in evolutionary intelligence theory. The professor was wiggling with excitement in his chair and tapped his sharp finger down on the desk. Professor, focus, the High Lord said, and the professor cawed a few times. Yes, yes, of course. Where sedentary predators had masses of young to scatter, the human focus on their communities would focus heavily on their young. It really isn't uncommon for there to be high investment in young, but it has never been seen before in an intelligent predatory species, rather than the young killing each other off to remove competition, or the parents using them as a food source in dire times. They invest heavily in tribal cooperation. And this tells us how to deal with them. The very thing that makes them so very dangerous, that everywhere they go they form cooperative communities that invest in their young, means that if we make them like part of the flock, if we treat them and their children as if they were adult members of the flock, they will regard us favorably. You mean war, don't you? The High Lord asked. The professor gave an unhappy bob of his head. Some of their numbers have gone off-world, looking for adventure as private mercenaries, prospectors, and explorers. Feed into their natural urge to form communities around their interests, hire their mercenaries, and send them to Galactic East, to the border with the Massives. Create a policy of flockade that renders help to any Terran ship in distress. Refer to them as treasured allies. If we treat them as part of the flock, their community will be our community and our community will be theirs. And if their mercenaries go home with stories of the danger of the Massives and the helpfulness of Goslians, we will have a valuable ally if the tension with the Massives ever grows. That is a bold, bold suggestion. We don't even treat the Galen as a flock member, the High Lord pointed out. The Galen do not form communities everywhere they go either, High Lord. For us and for them, it is a long process. But you see yourself, the humans are going everywhere. How do we want to be seen as flockmate or pankin? The professor asked and then imitated the open-armed gesture of the grand presider. High Lord Avon's feathers bristled. With the pankin gone, are there any aggressive species bordering the Terran ascendancy? The Zalians, an insectoid race, they're six jumps away and always looking to expand, the professor replied. Do you think they would start a war with the newcomers? The High Lord asked. I'm not an expert on Zalian politics, but unless there is something they need, I don't think so. The professor replied passively. Thank you. That will be all for now. I believe it would be wise to offer the Grand Presider some of our fleet to help protect his outlying colonies, a token of goodwill, and a warning to the Zalians not to trifle with the Confederation. And for that matter, perhaps we should suggest the same to some of the other member worlds. That should deter the Zalians. I don't think they'd want to pick a fight in those circumstances. But if they do... The High Lord's feathers relaxed and smoothed out. With new knowledge, he felt a tranquil sense of confidence that everything would be all right. The Zalian queen sat upon the larval bed while she absorbed the great knowing of her scouts. She had no eyes, for her eyes were her swarm. She had no legs. There was no need to move. She felt through the senses of her population. Most of it was just a dull, white noise, but with her personal attention focused on the signals that came through with the limited, autonomous judgment of importance from her collective population's experience. A new resource would generate excitement. An unexpected phenomenon generated curiosity. 
all filtering back to her to create a hierarchy of importance which she was constantly sorting through. When the Pankin Alliance was being annihilated, the sense of importance and danger that shot through the swarm observers drew her full attention. Her scout ship crews skirted the edges of the conflict, like opportunistic scavengers watching the war apes annihilate the once significant border empire. Curiosity was the predominant impulse when the danger passed, and the Zalian observers continued to hover near fallen Pankin worlds. The war apes ignored her observers until their populations occupied a world, after which her scout ships were politely but firmly warned that the area was now Terran ascendant space and they should leave. The Zalian queen complied each time, but they continued to watch and she continued to ask questions of the Keelan Confederation and to have her semi-autonomite drones ask questions of merchants and travelers who passed through war ape space. The media of the war apes was of little value to her, and her swarm had very little concept of entertainment. However, the impressions of the neighbor species had considerable value. So she took it very seriously when the Goslians and Kalanian patrol ships began to appear in Terran space and mix with Terran fleets. Strange. So strange. And also... Unacceptable. Unacceptable because these oversized patrols went from six jumps to three jumps from her species' claimed space. In part, because her species had taken another system, but also because the Terrans settled two more themselves. She activated her communication station and reached the Terran colonial governor for the sector bordering her own. The war ape was dressed in his usual blue. His was not the only species that wore clothing, but seeing through the eyes of her aid drone, it was nevertheless still confounding to the Zalian queen. Majesty, he said and inclined his head. To what do I owe the pleasure? I have seen that you took another system. There were four worlds there. We had our eyes on that one. She said to him, her mandibles clicked rapidly when she spoke, unable to contain her annoyance. Perhaps you did, but we have our ships on it, he said. You will take no more systems that bring you close to Zalian space. She gave the brusque command, and the human stood in silence. With respect, Majesty, all worlds formerly under the dominion of the Pankin are fair for us to seize, including those with a surviving population of Pankians. You have no claim on those systems we do, he pointed out. You will take no more systems which bring you closer to Zalian space, she commanded again. I will take no orders from anyone but our presider. His lips pursed as he spoke, and his eyes hardened on the drone whose chitinous, sleek, dark body shook with anger. If you would like a temporary neutral zone between us where neither of us lands ships in those systems until such time as an official treaty can be negotiated between our governments, I have it in my power to grant a six-month stay of settlement. Yes, that will be acceptable. The Zalian queen replied, You will land no ships in the border systems. And neither will you. He replied pointedly, No. She answered, Tell your presider to arrange a meeting at a neutral location. We will talk of safe borders. I will. The governor of the region agreed and sent his recording to the Terran government. And the grand presider in turn reached out to the Gielan Confederation allies to act as intermediaries. Four months later, the Zalian colony ships touched down on the last few border systems, and the Pankin survivors were hunted to extinction, turned into biomatter. The transmission played to the Keelan Confederation Hall and all of their delegates. There is no further need for a conference. The matter has been resolved to our satisfaction. The entirety of the council erupted. Noise engulfed the Great Hall as the transmissions and in-person delegates alike condemned the occupation. An outrageous act of aggression in violation of faithful terms. The Keelan ambassador pronounced, a sentiment echoed by the rest. Yet the human grand presider was silent. As the biggest losers in the affair, expectant looks fell to the presider, allowing him a moment to erupt in outrage of his own. Yet he said nothing. He folded his arms in front of his broad chest and said in a voice like stone, We have a saying on earth. When people tell you who they are, Believe them. The Zalians have told us who they are. Killing the Pankin there was unnecessary. 
they had regressed technologically to the point of barely industrial levels, or in some cases even further. Returning them to their home worlds would have been easy. And yet the Zalians chose to exterminate them for no other reason than that the Pankin were there. I feel nothing for the Pankin, but such a pointless act without even a war? He shook his head. No, this tells us what I need to know about the xenophobic Zalians and their respect for non-Zalian life. More than that, their queen lied, pretended a belief in peace, and then occupied what we would have been willing to share, all but daring us to make war. They have shown their true face to us, and we will remember. It was an unexpectedly mild response from the Terran presider, enough so that it left the assembly quite uncertain. Over the next year, however, they began to see what the presider's response entailed. Recombinated clones to increase genetic diversity, and hundreds of thousands of couples were relocated to the border worlds. Similarly, small numbers of other races were invited to settle among the Terran populations, and the starbases began to expand. Four successive Confederation bills were passed that resulted in supermassive space stations, repair and construction bays, and massive industrial investment was encouraged or provided from both Earth and closely allied worlds. The Terrans even began encouraging subject allies to relocate their poor or orphaned to the colonies, further boosting the employment and industry. The fleets also grew. Zalians ate the pankin. What would they do to us? The question kept the fleet slowly growing, and it was not lost on the Zalian queen. We wish to negotiate terms of trade and free passage to reach other worlds. She sent that transmission to many races and found herself blockaded. High Lord Avon looked at the proposal which sat on his desk. Humans would provide material in the event of any invasion by the massives. And if there were a three-system deep push entailing occupation or a two-system deep push by annihilation, human fleets would render aid, as long as no travel or trade was conducted with Zalians, and any Zalian-initiated conflict began. One of these reached every border region around Zalian space, didn't it? Or something like it, the old professor asked the High Lord. The way his bobbed his whole body spoke of his excitement. I assume so. The Zalians are quite bottled up, and they are feeling the strain. But it seems that the humans have proven adept at forming friendships with non-hostile neighbors. Their diplomatic acumen is impressive. There's only one uninhabited system within one uninhibited jump of Zalian space now, and the humans put a science station there. That is always a precursor to colonization. Do you think the queen will take the bait? The professor asked. She is used to getting her way, and she managed to take from the Terran ascendancy once before. She probably knows the war apes are behind her difficulty expanding. I'd say she'll see this as a dare, and because she was successful before, she will dare again. I think the presider knows it, High Lord Avon pointed out. I'm not an expert on the Zalians, but they can't be that stupid, the professor insisted. To that, Avon answered only with silence and bristled feathers before he signed the formal agreement. Grand Presider Maxwell listened while the Zalian Queen spoke. We will take the place you do not live. We have a space station there. We are in the process of colonizing it, he pointed out. Your station can go, she replied with imperious confidence. Those are not mobile, it cannot, he replied. We will pay for it, she offered. We aren't selling, and we have people working on the surface now, he responded. We will remove your biomatter, the Zalian queen pushed. We do not want them removed. That world is ours, he replied with no change of expression. The Zalian queen could not frown, but the long, broad mandibles that were nearly the size of the human's torso clicked back and forth with agitation. Our worlds are too few to hold us. We need space to grow. The Zalian queen made the point. Our galaxy needs peace. Our peace needs trust. You showed we could not trust you. That is why your ships are not welcome. Nobody trusts that you won't occupy a world and turn its population into biomatter for your nests. Maxwell's hands tensed a little. One folded over the other on his desk. The Zalian queen shook with fury. The truth is bitter to the betrayer. He recalled the old expression. You did this, she hissed. Did what? 
Maxwell asked, barely able to restrain his smile. Turned our neighbors against us! The queen hissed again. I only told the truth. If it is bitter to you, what can I do about it? Indeed, a better question might be, what can you do about it? The grand presider let the question hang. The Zalian queen sensed the double meaning, proving herself not a total fool. What do you want, war ape? The queen pressed. You have some things of ours, things you took when we placed faith in you. Return them, and it may be that we and your neighbors have less reason to mistrust your ships. It may be that as long as you agree for your long voyage ships to travel under escort on predetermined routes, that trade will be reopened. And it may be if you agree to confine your war vessels to patrols inside your space, and for your long voyage ships to travel unarmed, that the rest of the galaxy can begin to trust you again. The Grand Presider's terms bit hard, but Zalians did not form alliances, only brief bargains for specific purposes, and his proposal flew in the face of standard practice. The universe is a large place, Queen of the Zalia. There can be room for all of us when we are willing to coexist. You try to provoke us to fight you, war ape, she accused him. The visual drone shook in time to her rage. No, I prefer to win without fighting, Presider Maxwell said plainly. War is a stupid, destructive waste. There's no glory there, whatever the stories say, just the guilty, the dead and the ones who wish it never happened. This isn't a provocation, this is a warning. You wonder why we've built this coalition, why us, war apes, were so adept at talking and negotiating until we have you encircled. It's because there are only two options. Peace or war? She finished the thought, listening with sudden attention to the war ape. Yes, peace or war. Humans became very good at diplomacy making it one of our most potent arts and potent weapons because we terrified ourselves, apex predators in a world that casually obliterates anything living on it. We learned to fight with peace because if we did not, we would destroy ourselves. Now we face the larger universe, including you. War becomes more destructive, war becomes worse. Diplomacy becomes more valuable and more potent. We used our first weapon against the Pankin. Now we've used our second against you. Come to terms or attack. The presider replied to her and spread his hands apart on his desk, offering her two choices. I am making a choice for peace, and the entire occupied galaxy knows it. You can do the same. Give back what was stolen, and make peaceful overtures as I've described, or attack. Maybe you take my space station. Maybe you remove our biomatter. Maybe you kill our biomatter. But think how that would look. Everybody knows you don't value the lives of any but your own. You'll then show that you will not even respect even terms of peace. Nobody is safe with you as a neighbor. The presider went quiet. So did the Zalian queen. We give you the systems. You stop what you have done. She asked, less angry and more intrigued. One better. I will act as a broker with you, to help you come to terms with your neighbors for your own mutual security. The universe is a dangerous place. Who knows what terrors lie beyond the distant void? The massives make trouble in the galactic east, and the first signals of our own explorer vessels report finding degraded artificial radio waves, meaning there are undiscovered civilizations that may be far more advanced by the time we reach them. In short, he gave the Zalian queen a very polite smile. I destroy you as our enemies when I make you into friends. The grand presider watched the way the Zalian queen froze. He reflected on her response. She'd likely heard the concept before and learned of its utility. Two, she saw the tripled strength of the Terran borders when the Goslians and Gonic ships were added to the human strength. In the way or at your side, you say this among your people. Is it not? She asked. The translation was muddled at best, but he recognized her intent. Something like that. In our ancient mythologies, People believed in powerful monsters, the worst of which was the devil. And it was sometimes said that it was better to be at the devil's right hand than in its path. So, make your choice, Zalian Queen. You are devils, she said, and killed the transmission. Three months later, the Keelan Confederation listened with open-mouthed disbelief. I of the Zalian people express regret for the misunderstanding over the previous events regarding the occupied worlds. 
and will withdraw our swarm from each of the systems our misunderstanding led us to occupy. Let it be known that the Zalia desire peace to reign between our races, and we formally express our regret that this misunderstanding led to the deaths of the few Pankin left on the surfaces of those worlds. The negotiations that followed were swift. Headed by the human presider, predetermined routes were laid out over which Zalians could travel, and worlds or moons considered useless to other races. Resource poor or too expensive to convert to habitable zones were permitted for Zalians, always under strict conditions of non-industrialization for those worlds, allowing the Zalia to reduce their overpopulation without posing threats to their neighbors. The provocation led to the first formal long-term treaty of common defense for the entire Galactic West to sign. An agreement of common defense, fixed military patrols, cooperative actions, trade exchanges, and migration. By the gods of our abandoned past, they did it, High Lord Avon said to his Ganekian counterpart. They really did it. I never thought the Zalia would concede anything to anyone. They are a frightening race, and the queen was no fool. She knew she couldn't take on everyone. She was faced with a devil she didn't understand, and learned from it, the Keelan leader replied. He let out the huffing version of his race's laugh. I thought for sure the humans would provoke a war. I did not know it was possible to provoke a peace, a scary, scary race. Very much so, and it worked out well for us this time, High Lord Avon replied, enjoying a polite conversation for a while and more trivial matters before the conversation ended. For twelve years there was unprecedented levels of peace, until Grand Presider Maxwell's term of service ended and the human presider became the first non ganakian to become the speaker for the entire confederation. The first true challenge to his administration came not long after, when the massives made their demands on the Goslian border and mustered a fleet of thousands and sparked a crisis throughout the quadrant. Tell me about the massives, Maxwell said to the Goslian xenobiologist. The bird creatures were a curious lot, very avian in their traits right down to their feathers, and to his eyes, they had similar short-term family structures to some bird species of Earth. They mated for a few years, then most of them parted ways when their young were grown. It was still a wonder to the xenobiologists of Earth that other species could develop advanced societies with the structures they had. But they were a friendly race, and had been quick as the Kalanians under Galen to offer ships to help patrol the new human colonies. News back home was strongly pro-alien, and pro-confederation. Sore points remained over the Zalia, but the cooperative face-saving move of to allow it to be portrayed as a misunderstanding between alien species helped smooth things over. I should probably feel worse about the few pank in the Zalia finished off, but that is hard to let go of, and I would have to be something of a hypocrite to cry for them now. The thought came and went from the ex-admiral, the new Grand Presider was being advised by the first Grand Presider to lead humanity to the stars, and James Stoneworth Jackson had the sense to ensure that the new one, Presider, did not forget that the Zalia taught humanity another lesson. We cannot expect mercy from the Zalia. Any war we fight will only be fought once. In the eyes of the higher-ups, the Zalia were potentially worse than the Pankin. But the Zalia Queen showed sense and chose the peaceful option, whether she understood that she had taught humanity new lessons about her people or not was anybody's guess. But now the massives had all the eyes of the Confederation and the smaller, less affiliated groups, including the Zylian Empire, turned their way. The massives are a species evolved from a kind of biological igneous. Our study of their earliest evolution shows that they are descended from a kind of well, if you can imagine a moss made of sand that incorporated rocks into their structure, it bonded with their SNA. Uh, they're a silicone-based life form, quite unique. How? Maxwell asked. They reproduce very slowly, but because they require no food, feasting on rocks, they never had an agricultural period. Instead, they settled around mountains rather than by rivers as humans did, mostly active volcanoes. Their social structure is centered on dividing up mineral rights. Since their young grow stronger based on what kind of minerals they consume, they banded together to fight over mineral rights. That sounds very human, Maxwell thought, bemused. 
and the xenobiologist looked at him with confusion for a moment, until Maxwell waved it away. Forget it. Ask one of your specialists in humanity why I find the analogy funny. The Goslian cocked his head for a moment, then bobbed it and went on. They're hard to kill, and so their wars were never too destructive compared to ours, or even yours, and because they are so hard to kill, and because they have not developed a cultural aversion to it, they are more willing to wage it. They look for ideal mineral worlds and plant colonies there. This seldom brings them into competition with others. But over the years, their empire has slowly begun running out of space. You're kidding? Maxwell asked. No, their civilization is very old, and their core worlds are heavily populated. The weakness of their species is that rocks... Well, you can't really grow more of them. They've consumed their asteroid belts. There are no mountains left on their core worlds, and they eat a great deal. Their bodies are almost two meters tall and twice as wide as one of you when full grown. They are looking to relocate entire worlds, and there are not many suitable for that which are not occupied. Why not just send out massive... Oh, Maxwell stopped and the Goslian bobbed his head. They can't exactly grow food on the ship, can they? They've reached the limit of their jump drive capability to resupply their ships, and I guess not just any rocks will do. Exactly. The Goslian bobbed his head rapidly. Volcanic rock and some other materials are good, some others like iron or nickel, planetary cores, and silicone based. They could even live on sand, but they wouldn't live well. We know they sent out several ships, but we never caught any transmissions coming back after they ventured far beyond the known areas. We believe they starved in the void. Divided by entire systems as much as by species, it was still a horrible death to think about, dying in the abyss of hunger. So they're becoming aggressive, because if they don't, they won't last. Maxwell replied again, pity in his breast for the unfortunate massives. It gets worse. The Goslian xenobiologist replied, they understand that blood has iron in it, and bones are calcium-based, and many races are made of carbon. Simply put, about 3% of our bodies are made of metals. As my colleague tells me, 2.5% of human bodies are the same. Other races have similar proportions, with the Exalians having around 5%. Maxwell's face turned faintly green. So they want to what? Turn us all into food sources and raise us as such? He asked. The xenobiologist refuted that immediately. No, an intelligent race is a bad model for that. This is not one of your world's science fiction films. Rather, they want to use unintelligent animals for that, and other races are simply in the way, and they have worlds ready to be used for armies. They attacked one small world, found an unintelligent species that had a biomass of 15% metallic elements, of their most nutritious sort. They exterminated that world's inhabitants and began raising the discovered animal the way your species does sheep or cattle. So, if they were to remove the intelligent life from their path? The sentence did not need to be completed. I understand. Wipe a few species out, turn their worlds into ranches, and consume the material of those worlds to survive until you can create large harvests. They could empty their dying worlds very easily that way. And now they're on the Goslian border, Maxwell answered. You understand completely. Now what do you propose to do? I prepared for war, thinking I would end up fighting on our borders. I hope the other confederation and non-member worlds recognize that it is far, far better to fight on the far borders of our neighbors rather than on their own. But tell me this. Do you think the Massives will reconsider the military option if they're confronted by a united quadrant? He asked the xenobiologist, who went very quiet. If they have any other option, I think so, he answered. Diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy while looking for a rock, Maxwell said while pacing the floor. He was not in the assembly hall at that moment before the Kalanian Council. Rather, he was in his office on a ship while headed back toward Earth for a conference. But in front of him, a body-scanning projector was monitoring his image and displaying it on the council floor and to the many monitors of absent members, and unique in the last century and a half, non-members. That is a saying on my world. And if it helps, 
Doggies are predators we eventually tamed. He held his hands behind the small of his back while he paced. His pacing motion kept their eyes following him, focused on him. The ambush predator nature of most species in the Confederation meant that abundant motion kept them easily focused. He turned his steely eyes, the false left one glinting with literal steel that was off-putting and even intimidating to those whose bodies could not handle implants, directly at the camera. As you know, I am going back to Earth to speak face-to-face -face with the current Grand Presider, and I am transmitting this communication on open comm lines so that the massives themselves can listen if they wish. War is a terrible thing, even if you think you are hard to kill, and even if you win, there is a terrible price to be paid. It is for that reason that I spoke with peace before the Zalian Queen, and it is for that reason that I sought flockhood, brotherhood, nesthood, egghood, and bonds of trust with all the species of the Confederation, and more besides. I sent word to the Massive's ambassadors that if they stand down and if they withdraw their fleet six jumps from the border, I would exercise the authority of my office to veto any war proposal. We will not strike first. However, if the Goslians are struck, I will propose a common war by all members of the quadrant. And if a small planet, if an outpost, if the Zalia, if the Pankin, if any in this quadrant are struck, I will move for a general declaration of war by the entire quadrant, with a common public treaty proclaiming that no one planet or people will make peace independent of the rest. He let that silence stretch to be taken in. He looked away the stars at his back seeming so endless and beautiful, a common bond to most of the races he knew. They found the stars to be beautiful. If the massives will withdraw the fleet, he held out his hands, stretched together and cupped with palms up in an approximation of a gesture familiar to the massives to signal openness, I will propose a large-scale relief effort. We will help supply the resources you need, allocate unoccupied moons and planetoids, and other environments to help you propagate the species of animal that will help you survive. The animal life with proper resources which are not consumable by us, we can trade to you. This is the chance for peace. Take it. Because we already have many rocks ready to use if the government of the massives should choose the path of war. Zalian Homeworld The queen had no counsel, for the Zalia were like one and yet that did not make her burden less. The humans will fight with us. The Confederation will fight with us. What a very strange thing. She thought, and yet it was not lost on her that this routine of cooperation had yielded the Confederation a superabundance of strength that forced her to reconsider her early plans for conflict. So she tried her best to incorporate this new knowing into her way of seeing the universe. It was no easy thing and as she sorted her mind through the many signals of her race on her worlds, she found an analogy. A swarm fights as one, but there are many drones. Their cooperation is like making many drones into one while keeping different minds, like every one of them is a queen unto themselves. It was still bizarre, but having hit upon it, with the first massive fleets moving closer to the outlying neighbor systems, and the memory of the way the quadrant hemmed her in still fresh in her mind, she embraced it with the fervor of a religious convert. She made her transmission not long after, sending it directly to the entire council. Zalia will support this measure. If one is struck, Zalia will strike back. When all cease to strike, the Zalia will cease to strike. Pankin homeworld. That the demons who destroyed their empire and nearly drove them to extinction were now openly proclaiming their willingness to protect the defenseless homeworlds was not lost on the survivors and the remaining government sought from this an opportunity. Their own council leaders transmitted a crude but simple offer to the Terran ascendancy. We will raise volunteers to fight in the war, as long as what they are paid can be deducted from our reparations, or we are permitted some small reindustrialization on each world. No answer was immediately forthcoming when word reached Earth, but they knew all they had to do was wait. Goslian Homeworld when word reached the Goslian systems, cheers and pro-Terran sentiment were both soaring higher than the clouds. The reputation of the war apes and their destructive capability eased many a trembling heart along the border worlds. But nowhere was the relief greater than in the office of High Lord Avon. 
It may be self-interest, but if it's self-interest or true flockhood, as long as they have their ships on the border, that is all I care about. But the real question is, will the massives take this seriously? They've never fought the war apes. They've never seen Terran violence. They have not seen how far the Terrans will go if pressed. The information is there. If they're smart, they'll avoid a war that takes them against an entire quadrant. But then, they've also never lost a war before. And we lost to them once. The harsh truth kept the Goslian High Lord silent. His advisor on the matters of the massives was being truthful, but that did not make it less painful. It all depends on whether or not they see this as strength or weakness, but I think they will see it as strength, the advisor answered. Massive homeworld, mountain voice. Ignarius grumbled as he looked at the open transmission from the ones the Goslians had dubbed war apes. So, small, little hairless bird, they think we should fear that? His gravelly voice was echoed by the admirals of his fleet and his advisors. I think they play up these war apes to try to make us afraid. I think these other peoples, all are afraid. They unite out of fear, and fear is weakness. Sir, we should at least consider what they are offering. Perhaps we won't save all our numbers if we accept their offer. But if the rest of them are true stone, we will lose fewer than if we fight. The council member to speak was on the smaller side, and this immediately had him somewhat denigrated by the massives in the chamber. The rocky fist of the mountain voice stood up. If we win quickly, then we will lose few. Our ships are big, and we have never known defeat. Destroy a few worlds. If we harvest them, then offer peace. The whole will crumble. Sir, the Zalia refrained from fighting the Terran ascendancy. We beat the Zalian incursions, but that doesn't mean it is easy. We still have time. To starve, Mountain Voice Ignarius of the Massives said with blunt dismissal. When the rest of the fleet has reached the border, attack the Goslian border stations and worlds. War apes, lizards, insects, Ursinian, none of them matter. Massives tower over all. What after all could threaten us? Nothing. Nothing, I think. The heavy stomping feet in the chamber drowned out the few who dared to object and war carried the day. Humph. War apes. Stupid name. You are new to the galaxy, and we will teach you to be afraid of it. It was a satisfying feeling to the mountain voice, and he sat back down to absorb the praise that was hurled his way. A long time ago, our people fought a truly massive war. Well, massive relative to the time, can you guess what caused it? Maxwell asked the Goslian High Lord. I doubt it, the Goslian replied as the pair walked through the tree garden on the Goslian homeworld. Your race invented a form of long-distance communication through wires we did also. We called them telephones and ran them along high poles. One of the greatest wars of our history was sparked by an international argument over rebuilding or paying for those from the previous fight 20 years earlier. It was a little nothing of a spark that launched flames of war that would end in nuclear fire. Great things begin from very small causes in our experience. In ours also, High Lord Avon remarked with a mild cluck like chuckle. It seems we have that in common our race gained its unity after a fight over nesting grounds. The great lords decided that they should just have their children pair off there and, after that, it became easier to unite. Still slow, but it was inevitable and everyone knew it. Unity for us finally came when the Pankin did. They killed thousands of our young, but it was killing one that was caught on camera that sparked the flames of their destruction. They taught humanity a valuable lesson, that to be disunited is to be vulnerable, and that there were threats beyond our knowledge that we had to meet. Do you know what that band was there for that day? Moel asked. But he didn't wait for an answer, he answered it himself. They were there for ginger snaps. Apparently their commander developed a taste for them and there was a little small town in the Midwest that had a warehouse storing a lot of them. The woman was there to visit her husband during lunch and brought their infant to see him. He was crying, as I heard the story, because she'd forgotten the formula, and she forgot the formula, because she slept in and had to rush. She slept in and had to rush, because she stayed up late, listening to her brother unload about his wife's affair. 
now here we are. Maybe things would have happened this way eventually anyway. But if the Confederation didn't have human aid, what was the timetable for defeat? About a year, Avon admitted. Suppose our outrage hadn't taken hold then. No human armies equipped with Confederation technology. The Confederation would be gravely weakened. The Pankin Alliance was not exactly kind in victory, I have heard. Humans might have made the leap to space at large eventually. But we would have been alone. It would have been a very hard fight if we were lucky. Likely we would have at most become a xenophobic backwater surrounded by a powerful and brutal enemy. They might have fought the Zalia and won or lost eventually. Or not. And now with the massives on the move, I doubt the Pankin would have helped, and whatever was left of the Confederation couldn't have. The broad-shouldered Terran speaker's point became abundantly clear. The Terran ascendancy, the annihilation of the Pankin Empire, the largest Confederation membership in a century and a half, and now a grand coalition on the way to your borders, all because one woman cheated on her husband and a pirate lord liked Ginger Snaps, then sparked a series of events that led us to the present. The universe is absurd, isn't it? He asked with a deep, hearty laugh. I suppose it is, I suppose. It is, High Lord Avon replied while the human looked on with fascination at the great high trees. I take it that since you're here, the Terran Ascendancy voted as you wished? They did. We recognize that it is far better to fight far from home than in your own streets. We need only wait to see what the massives will do. Maxwell replied and laid a hand on a large purple bark tree. Beautiful garden. It reminds me of the forests at home. Other than the wildly colored trees, ours are all mostly gray or brown in the trunk. Thank you. These gardens have been carefully tended for centuries. It's a point of pride that each continent manages them for seven years. Competition to be one of the ones to work here is fierce. The High Lord preened a bit at the praise. Meeting the former admiral in person was proving to be a unique experience. What do you have on the way already? The High Lord asked. The 49th will be here in a few weeks, comprised 12 battleship class and their escorts. We even took a page out of the Zalia playbook and made a few swarm carriers. A good idea from a rival is still a good idea after all. Maxwell chuckled, but it made Avon's head spin. They're so mad for new things that they rethink their whole doctrine every few years. He kept that thought to himself when Maxwell went on. The blood miners will be along shortly. That's kind of a showy group. They're formally referred to as the 42nd, but they named themselves after a group of rebels in a book by the author I mentioned. Escaped slaves that went on a killing rampage after they were set free by the one in that book referred to as the Mother of Terror. They paint their ships red and focus on encircling their prey to bring them down. During the war against the Pankin, they brought down the flagship that way. We'll have several more inbound over the next few weeks beyond that. The Massives could destroy a number of border worlds before then if they struck tomorrow. High Lord Avon looked up at the green sky overhead with a shudder. We will have to hope they don't, but if it helps... Maxwell then handed the High Lord a tablet and the feathery figure swept through the data on screen. That many? he asked with dismay. I just got word a little while ago. I'm sure that information is on the way to you already. I admit you may lose the border worlds, but by the time they're done there, the whole quadrant will have showed up for the fight. And if it comes down to it, we'll help you rebuild. Even if we have to use the bodies of the massives to make bricks, Maxwell said, and put a hand up on the slender avian leader's shoulder. Any response he could have given was cut off when both of their communicators went off at once. The two traded wide-eyed looks that crossed the boundaries of species, and then as one, they answered their devices. The sound was horrific. Crashing metal and showers of sparks, the gouts of flame were being fought. But even while the Goslian on the other end was screaming out his message into Avon's screen, the viewport beyond made it clear enough what was happening. A massive ship was in full view with its weapon ports glowing. A supermassive asteroid hollowed out and converted into a starship. The thing was pockmarked with the evidence of a futile resistance, as much as it was the little impact craters of countless eons of time. The transmission cut off a moment later. 
Maxwell's communication, however, continued. The massives have just penetrated the Goslian border and destroyed the relay stations. Before communications were cut, they managed to transmit energy signatures, sir. This won't be easy. We'll make it a lot harder on them. A lot harder. Relay the vote to the Council. A quadrant-wide declaration of war on the Empire of the Massives. When we're done with them, their language will be spoken only in hell. Admiral Iganati watched as the Goslian forward offensive became a defensive, and the defensive became a withdrawal. The withdrawal became a rout, and a rout became their last stand. They did as well as they could, but what is metal but weak stone? He watched the last ship begin to list, burning in space as the gas caught. It would burn out soon. Most of the others did too. The Goslians seemed to like their bird-like designs, and whether by artistry or accident, they intuitively designed their craft like a bird, with the bridge at the head instead of buried deep within. Their ships soared compared to the way the massives seemed to tumble forward the interior gryoscopically balanced within the thick asteroid rotation. It created a naturally cycling armor and made their ship's weapons and systems very hard to pierce. They have other fleets, Admiral. This was only the forefront of their defense. The first officer replied as the first Goslian planet came into view. The Admiral ignored that. Population, he asked. It's only a colony world not even 50 years old. Twenty million mainly concentrated on a single continent and six cities, the first officer answered. Remove them, the admiral ordered. The admiral did not watch the button being pushed. Instead, he zoomed in on the view screen as broken hulks of the forward fleet tilted off and crashed against the asteroid-turned ship. His view of the Goslian cities showed a disgusting mess of greenery, trees, and other hideous things. And after a mere few seconds, the fire of their weapons began to cleanse the Goslian cities. The avian race ran, of course, or tried to, but the devastation of the withering fire reduced the cities to ash. What about the outlying communities, towns, villages? The first officer asked. Leave them. They won't pose a threat when our infantry finally hit ground. They can clean up, move on to the next world. He gave the order, and his fleet obeyed. Six border worlds were burned of high population density areas in the days that followed until the smoke of each world was visible from space itself. Nor was his the only fleet. A dozen light years away, Admiral Ignol pushed the button himself, and down below a furry species of the frozen tundras began to feel flames lick at their bodies, and another hundred million died either quickly or in pain, as the population was neutralized to make way for the invasion. It was a small, independent planet on the Goslian border, one of two occupied by a more recently spacefaring species. 800 light years away, the massive's largest armada began its move against the border worlds that encircled the outlying Zalian territory and found the very first surprise. Admiral Igbalam turned his body to look down at his first officer. Is that a Zalian fleet? It can't be, can it? The calm light came on. Admiral of the massives, the Zalian Queen warns you to turn back your fleet. Aggression will be responded to with aggression. You will go no further. The transmission cut off without allowing him the courtesy of a response. Sir, the other border species have sent ships. This may not be the easy part. Igbalam thought that over. Briefings did indicate that some semblance of unity existed in this quadrant. Absurd as it sounds, they aren't of the same mountain. Tension hung in the air. His fleet began to curve out at the wings. On screen, the fleshy ships of the Zalia with their shiny carapace-like armor, their undulating designs with their many forefront weapons, were complemented by the smaller ships shaped like triangles and bristling with small projectile weapons. Less advanced species, they survived chiefly because the bordered the Massives, the Goslians, and the Zalia and anyone attacking them would be considered a likely threat toward the others. And now it was so. Open fire! Break the bugs! He gave the order, and their weapon systems powered on. In the Keelan Confederation Hall. The video of the massives wiping out mass populations, a final transmission of a Goslian ship before the Maker themselves succumbed to whatever killed him in the black void of space, 
played before the entire quadrant. The motion passes, uniform war against the massives until they have surrendered entirely. There will be no peace for one until there is peace for all. Maxwell's image said, and around the quadrant the cheers of approval went up. But nowhere, not on in the office of Galen, not even on the homeworld of the Goslians, was it more celebrated than on Earth. Not, paradoxically, because they loved war, but because the chance to fight it before it came for themselves again was presented. The wail of the mother's despair had become an almost cult-like symbol in the years since the war against the Pankin introduced humanity to the abyss at large. Human culture changed, between our children and the desolation of the abyss, became the slogan that brought human weapon research to the cutting edge as they studied the biology and structure of every species they encountered. How best to kill that one? It was the first question to be asked, and investment in ship technology, medicine, and production advanced to new heights. The fleets of humanity left Terran space weeks before the massives launched their attack. Jump after hyperjump, they and the others advanced on the best possible position for a fight, ready to make a stand even if they had to concede a few worlds. But along the way, they did something else. Information is the enemy of lies, and if a man shows you who he is, believe him. They were not just Terran expressions. Some form of them existed on most worlds with intelligent life. To that end, small drones, barely the size of microchips, were fired toward the worlds that would need to be given up in order to buy time to gather their forces together. These drones did nothing more than record and transmit, and as they did so, they carried the stories of the xenophobic massives out across the quadrant. Goslians, Ulusians, Kalanians, and they kept these transmissions going all the way through the destruction and through the landing of the infantry, the massive's cleanup operations. The people could not be saved, but their stories were, and they were told, then retold, through video screens around the quadrant, with a message added by the Terran's grand presider, translated into every language in the quadrant. They are coming for you, too. Will you let them? Weeks became months as the Massives and their supply ships and replacements conducted campaigns of destruction. Zalia and neighbor world raids kept the two fleets constantly at odds. But the Massives were slowly pushing forward. And it was this situation which presented itself when the fighting 49th, the 42nd Blood Miners, and the first War Apes combined with the bulk of the Kalanian Confederation fleet and the Goslian High Flock. In an unusual move, Maxwell, despite not being an active admiral, took position on the Terran flagship, the Perry, and assumed command of a unified force. As they embarked, he whispered quietly to himself while they sailed into the void, into the abyss that terrified and entranced poets, adventurers, scholars, and warriors, to which the devout once prayed to, and which the milk of Hera, and which was now a road to war. He spoke to no one but himself, saying, Now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. Worlds are a dime a dozen. That's what makes the massives so foolish. There are planetoids, useless planets, asteroids. Even if what they need to survive is scarce, if they could just see beyond their own disdain and take the slightly harder choice, then they might be fine. Maybe they would lose some popple, but nowhere near what they're going to with their decisions now. So why do this? Maxwell asked. He was sitting at the table in the flagship's private meeting room, and around him, other chairs were filled with the images of leaders from the other species of the newly christened Grand Confederation. Because they desire the easy worlds, the easy matter, it is obvious, is it not? War ape! The Zalian queen replied, her mandibles chittering when she spoke. Because they don't value the species on those worlds, pushing them aside means nothing to them the Goslian High Lord said from aboard his own flagship. It was a sobering thought. Exactly, you're both right. They want the worlds and don't care what was on there. Many of my world's worst aspects of history were born of desire and indifference. Hatred, that often came later, but first, they just didn't value the lives of those who were already there. Hate was often used to justify it later. Many of my people still despise the Pankin to the point where they want the entire race wiped out. 
Not content with the humiliation, not content with returning them to agricultural stages, not content with debt, they want genocide. You opposed that, didn't you? The Kalanian asked. I did. I broke a threat, nothing more, nothing less. I don't mind telling you now. I violated a few orders and objections from my own crew back then. But I don't regret it. Worlds are cheap. But species, species that will never appear again, that is another thing entirely. Who cares about worlds? The universe produces them in such quantities and numbers that even the act of destroying one ensures that new ones will be formed from the rubble. Even if we scattered their molecules all over the cosmos, gravity would draw the pieces together around stars, and again there would one day be worlds. But a species? A species never occurs twice. We've seen millions of worlds in our telescopes and satellites, but a look at the fossil record of any world shows countless forms of life that will never be again. Not if we search the whole of the universe. Why bring this up, war ape? The Zalia Queen asked. Because I have asked the xenobiologists of every single member of the Confederation, searching for something else. I sought some proof, any proof, that we could make a trustworthy long-term peace with the massives. I spared the pankin. We spared the pankin. But we knew they could learn to get along with others. They'd done so before and could again. I can find nothing to support this about the massives. I can find no instance of them being willing to live away from their own kind or share space with anyone else. Studies of their biology show them to be excessively territorial to the point where any attempt at sharing space with them has resulted in extermination. I pored over histories of the early confederation and found that they were known to have wiped out other species of intelligent life before. Their xenophobia seems only to be limited by their ability to exterminate other life. Can somebody, anybody, tell me otherwise? There was silence around the table. Anything? Any instance where they have shown mercy or lived cooperatively with others, or at least benignly ignored their neighbors if the neighbors had something they wanted? Is there any option at all to live with them? Maxwell asked the question and there was clear silence and nothing more in response. How have they lasted this long? He asked, almost unable to believe it. They are strong, the Zalia Queen acknowledged. Their ships are hard to pierce and their bodies hard to kill. Even my own warriors must drown them in our ichor sometimes to kill them. You are new, war ape, but they have fought many wars and won each time. The only reason they stop, we have said often, is because they had enough. They are a swarm of stone. Now they have not enough, the swarm of stone moves again. We fight, but we are losing. Two of our worlds have fallen, and you have not engaged. How much longer? Days. Their fleet approaches the cloud we are now hiding in. A small number of Goslian ships have rallied around a station protecting a small colony. When the massives approach, I will unleash our newest weapons. Which brings me to one final question. Is there anyone in this region that opposes returning the massives to the Stone Age? Maxwell looked around. The Confederation species at the table were numerous. And yet, there was no one speaking. Then I am now more terrible than Shiva, and the finger of judgment is pointed at the massives. The link died, and Admiral Maxwell sat and waited. He waited at the table, then he waited in his office, then he waited in his quarters. He waited until he slept, and a bright, fresh-faced youth came to his quarters to alert him. Sir, the armada is closing. They will be in range within the next four hours. The Goslians are scrambling at the outpost. Admiral Maxwell got up. He brushed his teeth. He washed himself. He put on his cleanest uniform and walked to the bridge of the Perry. When he got there, his weapons experts were waiting with big grins on their faces. Two hours remained. The others are in place. Right down to the music, Admiral. The youngest of the lot said to him, But what if I could ask, sir, is Ride of the Valkyries? Trust me, you'll love it. The Admiral replied to the young woman asked. She brushed back her short blonde hair and shrugged. If you say so, sir. She had a pearly white smile that caught the light just right and let him briefly forget just why she was happy. War apes, he thought. Accurate name. Many light years away, the hit and run campaigns of the Zalia and the neighbor planets were slowly pushing back the massives. 
Not far behind him, other Terran fleets were on the move to go assist those states, and still others were en route and linking arms to provide further assistance to the Zalia. On the Massive's flagship, one little starbase and a handful of fighters, then another Goslian system, the first officer said, almost bored. Only twenty small ships. For now, keep watch. There are a lot of places to hide out this way. If they're going to pick a fight, it will be here. The admiral commanded, and his ships began to close in for the kill. It was beautiful, watching the great gifts of the The Life Maker rolling forward through the endless darkness. The many sublight rockets now providing direction would emerge, provide direction or speed, and retract again. Everything was rotational, making it impossible for these types of crafts to be caught off guard. They were the screening force, and well-suited to resisting Goslian ship-to-ship weapons. Their tendency to put weapons on the wings and beneath the ships made them a little bit predictable. True to his expectations, out of the great gray-blue gas cloud soared a number of Goslian and Kalanian ships. The Kalanians were sleek, smooth, and made of a green alloy not readily familiar to the Admiral, but their weapons were packed to the tops of the ships. Missiles, rods, plasma shots, lasers, they filled the void of space as the two sides fired back and forth. As I predicted, an ambush! The admiral's aide with smug confidence as the hundreds of ships began the long route that put them in between the planet and the massives. Keep it up, the admiral said, as the withering fire battered and shook their ships. The rotating exterior of their giant to small asteroid molded ships made an effective shield in addition to the field forces that blunted most energy driven damage, thus always presenting a fresh front to their more vulnerable enemies. For several hours, the Confederation front stretched out, and the massives moved ship for ship and cannon for cannon. More ships than I thought there would be, but fine. The comms light began to blink, an open channel. They can't want to surrender already. He mumbled and nodded to his first officer. What he heard next was the most awful noise to strike him in all his days. On board, the Perry. Do you think they're enjoying Ride of the Valkyries? Admiral Maxwell asked as the Terran flagship emerged from the cloud in all its glory. I don't know, sir, but I like it. May I do the honors? The young blonde officer asked, and he inclined his head toward her. Please be my guest. She pushed the button, and the ports opened, and the drones shot out. Electron spin-guided drones allowed warfighting from far beyond the speed of light's ability to transmit data and so the development of advanced drone technology meant that an entirely new form of warfighting was possible. Gamers became gods of war. Tens of thousands of drones shot out like rockets while squads of players at home on Earth paid for the privilege while others hired as leaders drilled everybody constantly against simulated massive technology. Using realistic physics and endless lives for 18 hours per day, Gamers gamed and guided drones piloting against known massive tactics. Their little drones were cheap, but packed a punch. And these swarms targeted the weapons, cannons, and thrusters of the massive ships whenever they emerged. Like a video game end boss whose weakness appeared for seconds at a time, the war apes' urge to play became the means by which they killed. Firing hypervelocity microtubules which, laden with explosives, began to create eruptions inside the ships themselves. Behind the massive came the next round of ships, skeleton crews. They had two key features designed to deal with the immediate foe. The ships were long and cigar-shaped, except for the base which was rounded and held an abundance of propulsion power. The next was a slew of cables, as the Goslians and Kalanians pounded the forward shields, thus weakening the rest until the drones made them irrelevant. These ships fired their cables with carbon fiber drills at the tips that began to dig into the rock. With no real damage, at first except for the transmissions of other massive ships, their presence would have been little noted. Until the propulsion began to kick in and their cables snapped taut. It seemed pointless. Until more began to latch on and the most powerful propulsion systems of the Terran Ascendancy and the asteroid ships of the massives were pulled toward their own. 
Maxwell tried very hard not to laugh at the expression he imagined on the face of the massive's admiral as his smaller ships were turned into projectile weapons. The cable-bearing ships of the Terrans cut their ties and zipped away as the inexorable crash rocked the ships and the asteroids began to break apart. Next, Maxwell said, and the more traditional battleships began to emerge, the swarms of drones were taking what they would count as casualties. While back on Earth, bets were being placed and new drones bought by players eager to further the fight. The armada of the massives began to shift to deal with the new threat. And in so doing, they exposed their cannons to the drones, while the traditional battleships contradicted doctrine and aimed not at the nearest ships, but at the most distant. Their weapons, rods, rods that hit the weaker shields and detonated with the force of nuclear weapons. The tide was beginning to turn. Ready the next, let's target their flagship as soon as I give the signal. Call for the ruse. Maxwell gave the order and leaned forward toward the view screen, whispering, Smile for me, you son of a bitch. Atop the parry, the cannon aimed. Cobalt-cased tip projectiles were not unheard of, but because they were a threat, most ships had anti-missile defenses of some sort, usually chaff or targeted lasers that would strike at electronically guided materials. A handful of the little drones were hit this way, but while the swarm went on and Ride of the Valkyries began to reach its peak on yet another playthrough, the capital ship of the humans fired a very primitive solution. Javelins, cobalt javelins with tungsten steel lines, the sharp tips pierced the stone and the human flagship began to pull back. Send in the ruse! Maxwell shouted the order with excitement and the human star marines on various parts of the ship took their positions on the elevators that would carry them up to the platforms from which the drones launched before them. Equipped with state-of-the-art field suites, they could easily survive the icy cold of space. As soon as they reached the top, shouts over the radio of Go! 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 were echoed across to every team. Hoorah! The shouts went up as the Star Marines rushed for the cables, swarming over the hull of the ship and firing the rocket packs off to propel them forward. They grabbed the cables and began to shoot over the distance between the largest of the massive asteroid ships and their own. Maxwell had a little smile on his face when he got the message from the Zalia Queen, knowing the battle was coming. It was inevitable that she would have ensured she got a transmission of it in real time, as surely as the others did. War Ape. What are those? She asked. Her mandibles clicked with rapid, jerking motions. Maxwell couldn't hold his grin at that. We call them ruse. After a kind of animal called a kangaroo, the animal jumps to get around. Our star marines are known that way because... He waved to the view screen where the Terran star marines were jumping off the hull, grabbing cables, and after quickly snapping themselves into place, rocketing towards the enemy ship. You don't think you invented the idea of a swarm, did you, Queen of the Zalia? He asked. Wait and see. The Terran Marines zipped across the void and hit the asteroid dead on, and for the edification of his allies, he let them watch over a secure frequency. The Marines hit close to disabled weapons, points of egress, and drew from their sides not firearms, but long, single-handed rods, which they proceeded to stab into the rock. What are those? High Lord Avon asked. The eggheads call them rotational heat arrays, but they're more commonly referred to as plasma chainsaws, a nifty little tool, perfect for cutting up rocks. And what is it these creatures are made of mostly again? No answer came. None was needed. The swarms of Terran marines quickly widened the gaps around the dead guns and made their way within, tearing open the asteroid. They began to enter catching the crews entirely off guards. I don't know what the massives are expecting, but rocket-powered plasma chainsaw swarms of infantry probably are not on the list, Maxwell said with a hearty laugh. As he laughed, one ship crashed especially hard into another, their surfaces cracked. The hull breached, and even from afar the view screen caught sight of the thousands of massive crew members in both ships being blown out into space spewed out of the ships like a spray of spit at the face of the universe. The drones were starting to run out of targets. The rate of fire from the massive ships was beginning to slow down. Thanks to the love of gaming, 
Nerds all over my homeworld are going to be funding more drones, more launch craft. This war might be a bigger economic boom for us than the fight against the Pankeen. The Goslians and the Keelan ships began to rally and target disabled massives, but their rate of fire, too, was starting to slow down. On board the flagship of the massives. What do you mean, intruders? There can't be any intruders, we're not docked! The admiral shouted. Reality, however, contradicted him as he heard the death growls of his crew over their communications, and this dreadful, horrible howls like unto the wind of one of the great gorges of his home world. The sound of hissing, popping, and screaming hit his ears. He turned his head toward his first officer. View screen on the deck where that transmission came from. The monitor changed, and on it, he saw something he had never seen before. Waves of helmeted bipedal creatures were running over the area, killing as they went. They carried long rods in their hands with small spinning purple line that protruded just a little from out of the center. And it did the impossible. It cut through massive bodies like they were barely there. Despite being much taller and stronger and made of silicate, the massives in that area were unarmed. And the bipedal creatures worked in teams of four to six to surround and strike the crew members. Security, the admiral shouted, and the button was pushed immediately. He felt his body tense. War apes. These are the war apes. No Goslian or Kalanian would do this. Are they insane? He wondered about that, while the internal sealed doors would do to keep his ship from a blowout. Except for where they'd cut their way in through the gun ports, the whole point of a door was for it to be possible to pass through. The war apes took full advantage of that, and worse, massive security was both few in number and equipped to handle brawls. A boarding action of this sort was unthinkable. Order a retreat! All ships, general retreat! The admiral commanded. And order all compromised ships to self-destruct. We can't let ourselves be taken. We will not let this ship be hauled off like a prize. Plasma chainsaws are the best thing ever, Mikhail cried out as he cut his way through the door. I hope they start selling these commercially. And you ask why they call us war apes? Francesca asked from beneath her helmet. It was a comradely sort of derision, and he could feel the smile even if he couldn't see it. Point taken. Now everybody get ready. This is a security station. There's bound to be a bunch of rocks in here. They lined up behind six abreast, the light roaring noise of their weapons as they began swinging them in the door patterns they'd been taught to use creating more and more molten metal drippings as they cut their way within. The sound of the massives getting ready hit his ear as they broke the first gaps through, each side ready to die. Muhammad, James, Gabriella, three count for support squads. Then fuck em up, Mikhail shouted, and a kick of six heavy boots broke down the secure door and the war apes rushed in. They howled like maniacs. The first wave, two humans went down before the gap could be closed. The massives were brave, at least. Not just big, but the squads of six knew what to do. Each successive rank to enter took position to surround and cut the giant rock people down to pebbles bit by bit. The fight was brief and brutal, and repeated all over the ship. And from those with cameras, transmitted back to the flagship to in turn be broadcast to the entirety of the Allied forces. Zalia Homeworld. They have swarms. They have swarms, the queen muttered to herself. It had been ages since another swarm had faced off against her own, and that had been a rival queen of her own race before the unification. This changed everything. War apes are adaptable, flexible. Their lack of unity, I thought, was weakness. But they make it into strength. I must rethink everything. Pankin Homeworld the new Pankin Council watched the transmission of war ape madness. Nor were they alone. The government was now totally transparent after the debacle of allowing its secrecy before. So the transmission of the war ape infantry invasion of the Massive's flagship was broadcast on view screens on each of their few remaining worlds. Some were fascinated. Some were horrified. Some, however, were enthralled with the kind of culture that could birth a people like the war apes that had once not only humbled and nearly wiped them out, but which was now acting as impossible as it was to believe 
protectors of the quadrant. The very young, who had no living memory of the nightmare that had taken so many, began to view the Terrans very differently than their elders. Aboard the Perry. Most of the Massive's fleet was in disarray. Several had exploded. The great gouts of heat and flame that extinguished itself in the endless night of the void, fading away and taking any surviving crew members with them. Other Massive ships began to attempt suicide runs using their asteroid ships as rams. Time for something else, Admiral Maxwell said and broadcast word to the Allied fleet. We're going to pursue. Join us if you can. Remain behind if you can't. Oh, and enjoy the music, he said, and turned to his comms officer with a devilish little smile. Make sure the massives know. Everyone, let it be said throughout the whole galaxy that Terrans, war apes, go into battle with music at their backs. Play Beethoven's Ninth in D, the dramatic version. The Terran fleet formed up again, their ships keeping order where the massives retreated in chaos, some ships dropping back as they were damaged and unable to continue to withdraw. Massive homeworld. The transmission reached the homeworld, with the Terran music still playing. They fight like demons. Our fleet is in chaos. They have taken most of the flagship and continue to advance. I may have to self-destruct. Send out everything you can muster. They follow after us. The transmission became fuzzy. Hit the self-destruct. They're breaking through. And the hall of the Massive's Great Council Chamber sat in stunned silence as a trio of maskless flesh faces charged into view, howling out a dreadful noise as they began to cut down the towering men of stone. Little things, really. But they moved in groups to compensate. In silent, burning horror, the Council saw their best and brightest cut to pieces under the ever-present war screams, while war ape music accompanied the slaughter. The transmission cut out, just as the war apes raised their plasma chainsaws up and let loose something that was the same across all cultures and races, including the Massives. A shout of victory. We can't be broken, we are Massives, somebody said in protest but the black screen dared them to make a better argument than that, and none was offered. The music of the Terrans spread out over 10,000, 10,000 networks. The music of Terran children singing something entitled A Christmas Canon. The music went on a full loop and began to fade into the background with the appearance of the Grand Presider on the, the screen. The massive invasion has been stalled. They were stopped before they could penetrate into the interior. And even as I address you all, we are in pursuit with some of their captured ships. As everyone is now aware, another assembled fleet of our allied states is coming together to rush to the aid of the swarm. The Zalia will not fight alone. The flagship Sparta and its sister ship the Athens are leading the strike. He let that statement hang. What lies ahead is a long war. A war that should never have happened. The hostility of the massives was known to all, and yet... They attacked. Why? He didn't leave them wondering long. Because they thought they could win. They saw a disunited quadrant and believed they could win because of it. They thought it would be easy because we all stood only for ourselves. True, we have our confederation. But there are many others not party to it. And could the confederation have won by itself? The ugly question had a nasty answer admissible in trillions of private minds. Unlike past leaders, the Terran chose to speak to every citizen in the Alliance, his words reaching their radios, video monitors, listening devices, and more. Streamed on every channel, public screen, and more, at his back was the empty void through which he sailed. The Massives will lose this war. Our swarms, our allied ships, they prove a greater truth that is as timeless as time, that together we are strong. Apart we invite weakness, united. The galaxy is open to us all. Let no planet in the quadrant stand alone. There is room enough for all in this universe if they are willing to live in peace. But we know that in this universe, not everybody will. Trillions of galaxies are simply not enough for them. A planet began to grow larger on the screen. Therefore I propose a change. A change to how we as a quadrant do things. We are many. We are different. But if we put forth first and foremost the right of all peaceful races to live peacefully, we can unite as never before. 
We can enshrine this in a law that all will follow. A three-tier government, a single presider, a Senate composed of two representatives of each people, and a representative house which represents the numbers of sentience. To protect the interests of all, the powers of each will be divided. Further, the top legal minds of every race will craft a common set of laws which hold true in space between every world. In doing this, we craft the first stellar hegemony, a united federated system of peoples that will allow us to face the universe together. In the background, the quiet music calmed, and dreadful lyrics began to reach every ear or semblance of ear. The name of the music in a small corner, tear down the bridges. And for those who will not live in peace, there can be only one end against the might of a united hegemony. The world loomed large, and across the many view screens, the name of the massive world scrolled. He pushed a button with his false hand as he entered orbit and said, Go on, give them back their ship. For a moment, the quadrant was confounded, until the view showed the asteroid ship looming large and descending toward the planet with its thrusters on, so that it traveled at one third light speed toward the surface. That asteroid is eight of our miles wide. A six mile wide impact at far less speed caused a mass extinction on my world over 65 million years ago. The massives were kind enough to arm us with a number of these weapons. We're going to give them back until they submit unconditionally, or there are no more of them left to surrender. For the first time in an age, from the Zalia Queen's Nest, to the Pankin Council, to the Terran homeworld. The entire quadrant was silent at once. We will forge unity from our disunity, if you are willing, and settle the whole of the galaxy together, in peace, in brotherhood, in security. And may any gods there are, preserve those who stand in our way, because together we will win through. He looked down at his officer. Take us to the next world. We have more ships to return to the massives. The transmission cut out, and were there any gods looking down on the living of the many worlds? The roar that followed would have rendered them deaf. Then the words, stellar hegemony, was on every mandible, beak, tongue, and more. The massives of the homeworld watched the open transmission with alarm. Send another fleet! How many fleets do you think we have? All of them. Every single ship. We can still beat them. We just have to hit them hard before they reach the core worlds. Will that really work? I think so. Most echoed the agreement that it could. But for some, the question could only be asked, what have we done? The Galactic Union was never more than a name. A loose association in which the various interstellar bodies met and talked. More of a social club than anything else. It had no power. It had no authority or agencies. It was nothing more than one single space station that held the hundred or so odd intelligent species from around that part of the galaxy. Permanent diplomatic presence, with the diplomats all living on site, various planets and empires all providing for their own personnel, and supporting it financially and materially by lottery. It did have one thing going for it, however, and that was that it facilitated vast cultural exchanges and any ambassador who liked something another culture created tended to rapidly popularize it back on their home worlds. In short, a social club and a cultural exchange nexus, a lot of interstellar negotiations took place there on an unofficial basis. But the only thing that had been agreed upon in the last, ever, was that it should be a war crime to target Terran Young. Most of the galaxy's species found this bizarre, they formed friendships, yes, but it was those that were intense. The idea of caring so much for quickly replaceable young was staggeringly unusual. Similarly odd was the natural divisiveness of the Terran species, the meme, let's start an argument. This is a rock with a picture of what was obviously a rock, resulted in great confusion around the quadrant, particularly as they saw humans actually arguing over it as if that were done for fun. Equally bizarre was the Terran tendency to unite as quickly as they divided, with horrifying results. The Pankin were now regarded as endangered and had not launched anything into space except for soldiers in service to the fight against the massives. A dreadful fear of the danger of space was born from their experience against the Keelan Confederation and their war ape allies. Now it was questionable about whether they had a future off their own worlds.
It was into this environment that the admiral and revered speaker of the Terran's Grand Armada cast his speech calling for unification. As if they had timed it, the Terran Cultural Exchange Division released the totality of human history, culture, art, and music, from sub-Saharan Africa to suburban Los Angeles, from Milan to Tokyo. A cultural blitzkrieg was unleashed on the Galactic Union, an offering of friendship, a sharing, a gift, and a warning. Unspoken, perhaps even unintended, but it was a warning nonetheless. Do not fuck with war apes. The history of the Terrans was one of conflict, with peace the gap of time between two wars. Born from surviving two near extinctions, having won the battle for survival on a world with five major mass extinctions overall, rising to become an apex predator on a planet that casually obliterated walking and swimming killing machines. The offer of unity peacefully carried with it the unstated fact that war apes had emerged to travel the void between worlds, and it was easy to be at their side and at their back and hard to be in front of them. The common population of most species didn't truly grasp this. For them, the stories, the music, the art, all these things were simply new and unlimited media for consumption. Anything less unified than the Zalia swarm was interested in that. And the Zalia were the first to say, unity is good with total control over her population growth. The Zalia Queen recognized how much her race could benefit from unification. Peaceful expansion and a whole other swarm to call on. How could she say no? The other races, the minor ones who lived too close to the border with the massives or other larger nations or empires, also quickly jumped on board with the idea. A way to traverse the stars without fear, new worlds could open up, new trade lanes and new opportunities. The Keelan Confederation wasn't far behind, and from there a domino effect began to take hold. Consumption of Terran media, ideals, and the ever-present promise of total security under an amalgamated empire was too good to resist. And no people wanted to be the odd ones out, let alone surrounded by voices who were on board. But while that was going on, the fleet continued to return ships to the massives. On the view screen was a scene being transmitted across the cosmos, a massive asteroid ship careening toward another massive world and causing untold catastrophe. There was a beautiful, terrible simplicity to the Terran Admiral's approach. I don't have to take their worlds. I have to disable their worlds. If I do that, we can go back and take them anytime. The massives are hardy, big, strong, but they're not invincible and a total collapse of their planets through environmental destruction will do the trick just fine. So, on they went. The massives had their great ships, harvested from many asteroids around many worlds, hollowed out as needed, but otherwise the rock left over from the formation of planets was mostly intact. Jump to jump, system to system. But the massives had many, many worlds. Ample time to raise another fleet. Hence, the Allied advance paused periodically to take on more ships. Soaring through the endless void, the Terran Admiral watched the viewscreen showing the ever-growing fleet and listening to the tally of electing worlds. He raised his brow when he heard that the Pankin remnant voted overwhelmingly in favor of joining the galactic hegemony. Seeing the Terrans recreate the KT extinction might have helped. The Keelan, the Zalia, one by one the larger empires voted, or otherwise decided that the lesson of the massive invasion would not need to be repeated. It's the threat as much as the promise, Great Master Urlanish said in conversation with his sometime Iurlian rival as they sat around over drinks in the Grand Space Station. On the view screen, the war ape admiral was pointing to another massive world, and one of the ships that was previously weaponized hit, and the world cracked. How many massives do you think were on that world? The giant fur-covered Great Master asked, his short snout exhaled briefly. Not enough for my liking? The Aurelian's feathers ruffled. Not enough? He dipped his beak in the long glass to drink. They'll be more endangered than the Pankins soon, but then, that's the point, isn't it? Shatter the biggest and most destructive empire in the quadrant? Then talk about unity? They're expanding more all the time. Whoever heard of using clones from home to settle new worlds? You're rambling. The Aurelian smoothed his white feathers and then went back to drinking. You're not wrong, but you're rambling. 
Another hundred years, maybe less, they'll have more colonies than the Zalia. If the whole quadrant unites, maybe we can finally find out what's out there in the great beyond where even the massives couldn't reach. Dreamer. But I can't say the idea doesn't have merits. Free trade between all planets and... He was cut off when the real-time view screen showed the unexpected. The asteroid ships of the massives, hundreds of them, the war ape, far from fearful, had an expression on his face that the rest of the galaxy had started to refer to as war ape bloodlust. Play some music for them. Nobody should die without good music in whatever passes for their ears. Triumph by Tapanese. Oh, and raise the alarm for our allies. Tell them it's payback time for the terror the massives exerted over this quadrant. We're going in first. They can do whatever they want. A moment later, he took his seat in his command chair, strapped in, and said, Open a channel to the massive admiral. Back on the station, the buzz was clear. Are they really serious, transmitting all this? Show-offs. But the admiration, the eagerness to watch it unfold from one species to another, was clear. The massive admiral appeared on the Terran admiral's screen. Are you coming to offer us your unconditional surrender? The Terran admiral asked. Of course not. What stone submits to meet? The admiral asked, affronted. Every mountain we've ever climbed. The war ape answered. And now it's your turn to be mounted. And since you're not going to surrender, and you're about to learn that even rocks can break, there's one thing I've always wanted to say. One of my favorite authors from the 21st century wrote of an occasion where a noble champion attempted to challenge an invader to a duel, announcing his name, his status, and drawing his sword for the clash against the woman known as the Mother of Terror. Can you guess how it went? The massive admiral seemed more confused than anything, looking behind him at his crew. The war ape laughed. She completely missed that he'd even offered the duel, gutted him and moved on without noticing. But as she charged, she said to him, What I say to you now, Fuck thee, he bellowed, killed the transmission, and bellowed over the comm lines, Break those rocks! Though the sub-light speed rods were fired off by the hundreds as the Terrans began their attack run. Far, far from the battle amidst the stars, votes were being tallied. Decisions made, and as the Quadrant watched the Terran war apes go howling into the void as if they were born there, and so, unafraid to die in it, the first galactic hegemony was born. What kind of bullshit war cry is that? The Zensha ambassador asked his comrade, while the galactic union members sat around watching the fighting unfold. Fuck thee! How undignified! He sniffed with his long nose upturned. It makes more sense than yippee ki yay motherfucker, we still don't have a proper translation for that. His companion uttered with a roll of his long eye stalks. Oh, I don't know, the Iurlian answered when he sat down to join his companions. It may be crude, but that's humans through and through. They can be as reserved and dignified one minute, bloodthirsty the next. They're civilized war apes. Whatever they need to be, they become. Don't you know anything about the human homeworld? No, not really. I've heard it's absurdly dangerous, though. The Zensha ambassador muttered. I'm friends with the Keelan Confederation ambassador that first visited their homeworld. It's exceptionally dangerous. Volcanoes are still active. Their continents drift. High mountains and low valleys. Huge storms. Look, they have crazily diverse biomes. And they breathe a corrosive atmosphere that would kill most others. There is a reason they're often referred to as death breathers. If it hadn't been for the Keelan Confederation trading them internal breathing modulators, we might not have them going all over the place now. Hmph, what's your point? The Zensha asked. His long nose wiggled a little. The small whiskers at the end shook with annoyance, and his hunched armored body did the same a moment later. On screen, they watched as Terran drones swarmed a massive asteroid ship and blew a hole in it while Terran marines followed into the breach wielding plasma chainsaws. The open comms meant that the war ape's cries of bloody murder were heard across the quadrant. That, she said and shrugged, a place that kills its own species, over 99% of the them, created the ultimate predator. 
They're the sons and daughters of the few species to survive their mass extinctions. Survival of the fittest isn't just about strength. It's about the responsiveness to change. When the Pankin pirates threatened to exterminate Terran infants to impose compliance, they changed the rules of survival. Hatred, love, wild and bloodthirsty madness. They're a species of great extremes. Maybe so, but still, the Zen Shah huffed. It's not very polite. Neither is declaring de facto war on the quadrant, she replied. The Keelan and the Pankin brought Terrans into the fold. We changed their games. Now they're changing ours. The Zalia have never given diplomatic ground to anyone, not in 300 cycles. But they did when the Terran diplomats boxed them in. The Zalia queen isn't much for change, but the Terran admiral framed it as something she knew, understood, and loved. Unity. The Keelan wanted trade, so the Terrans offered the possibility of limitless free trade. The smaller worlds want security. Just at that moment, a massive ship exploded in a burst of flame as the rods of the Terran flagship pierced a reactor. Or perhaps it detonated itself, shattering rocks and bodies out into the void to sail on forever. And they're offering their security. My point, gentlemen, isn't that the war apes are only war apes. It's their diplomats and their flexibility that makes them so dangerous. In one blow, they united the quadrant set themselves a relative newcomer to stellar politics at center stage, and establish themselves as war leaders as much as political power brokers. We're thinking a lot about them as war apes, and missing where their greatest strengths truly lie. In their ability to understand us all, approach us with our deepest desires, and lead us into following them. It is the peace that they will win, not just this war. And once they have it, I think we'll give this stellar hegemony, and them, not only all the power they need to rule for eons, but they'll make us think it was our own idea, and glad we did it. War apes, but peace demons. Get used to it because... She stopped as another massive ship exploded on the screen, and some of the allied ships rushed into the gap of the field of fire while the Terran battleships provided cover. There's no getting around it after this. We'll all be their subjects, in fact, if not in name, and it's only the facts that matter. She dipped her long beak into the drink in hand and set it down on the table, empty at last. You're full of outlandish thoughts, the Zensha ambassador groused. It's an outlandish universe, and I've been right before. Just a word advice, old friend. When the Terran ambassador praises you for something, pay attention to what ideas are put into your head. I'll bet you it's something they want. She laughed and stood up. I'd best be going. My homeworld is petitioning for favored tourism status and the sweet, sweet credits that come with it. Creating that standing for trade purposes and promotion was my best idea yet. I had it while I was talking with the Terran ambassador, and now we're looking at a resource and technology exchange to facilitate it. She couldn't smile with her beak, but she gave them all a long, lingering stare to let that all sink in, and quietly made her exit. On screen, a Zalia swarm was digging into a massive ship while a Terran cruiser was picking off massive interceptors attempting to stop it. When the ship exploded, neither ambassador at the table could think of what else to say, though privately they wondered, was that really her idea, or was she giving us an example of Terran bullshit? Do you know what surprised humans the most about the rest of the species of the Mega Quadrant when we ended up joining the interstellar community? Grand Presider Albert Anderson asked when he sat down at the table. Around him sat other species, Urshans who seemed at first very bear-like, with their large, robust bodies and thick fur, until you realized those large bodies held eggs that would hatch a dozen young, and only about three would survive even if everything went perfectly. The pankin, a lizard species which had hundreds of young of which only a dozen might reach adulthood and only a fraction of which would reproduce. The keelan, another lizard-like species, but which had live young, however they were sure to have three or four, but thanks to year-round sexuality and constant fertility as well as low-cost pregnancy and fast lives, produced vast numbers in a lifetime per female. 
The Zalia voice, a creature which had only a mouth and ears but no ability to digest anything and which would die in very short order. The definition of disposable, and most unusually of them all, a massive, a speaker from the last massive city, his species was the rarest of all, still, but was the result of infused bacteria into particular types of stone, making their silicate bodies essentially a sentient colony with a high energy cost, but also made reproduction easy. What, war ape? the Zalian queen asked through her representative's mouth. She, out of them all, was one of the most dedicated to the galactic hegemony as an idea. But even a century after the war that destroyed the empire of the massives, she still retained a particular fascination for the human imperium, regardless of who the presider was. It was how little you all give a damn about your children, he said. His beige skin was wrinkled, and he gave a little smile before rubbing the whitening beard on his face. We still teach the Pankin incident in schools, though. He glanced toward the uncomfortable-looking Pankin ambassador. We put the blame more on the pirates being pirates for... political convenience now. We don't need old grudges lingering, but that does still fascinate our race. He gestured to the Kalanian and the Orion. You two are friends and can form bonds, even close ones despite being different races. You can and do do the same within your communities. That much we have in common. But nobody here forms meaningful bonds with their young except us. He shook his head. We're what we call a K-type species. We put a lot of resources into our young and reproduce slowly. Everybody else in the mega quadrant is an R-type, low investment with many offspring, or a hive mind that is just an extension of the self-gestating queen or something like that. It's really fascinating to our xenobiologists. He took up a knife and fork as soon as the plates were set down in front of the guests and began to cut his meat. The thick smell of steak filled his nostrils, and the others looked at his meal with curiosity as they dined on their own preferential foods. The human propensity for cooking wasn't unheard of, but it was still odd to most whose bodies had no real concern for the toxins food could carry. It made war ape dominance a greater curiosity still when they thought of how many natural vulnerabilities the humans seem to have. For us, children are worth dying for. Even enemies may feel pity for the young of those they kill. One of our most famous films featured an early war in which a young man promised to look after the children of the very man he killed. A child who dies, never marries, never has a first time with another person, never marries, never experiences the wonder grandchildren. A great deal is lost when a child dies. Your race is similarly curious. Remember if we're the norm, war ape, you are the curiosity. The Zalia queen pointed out, and the human inclined his head toward her. You speak the truth, and that curiosity, whatever the cause, brings us all here today. Among the stars, in a station on the edge of the mega quadrants, into contact with one another. Curiosity is the foundation of civilization, in my view. The Grand Presider said, and waited for argument. None came. But that also leads us into danger, and that danger is out there. He pointed to a window into outer space. It led out into the empty vastness of the dark, in the direction from which no one had ever returned. It was the massive speaker who addressed the issue. You speak of the void. My race tried to cross it for centuries in search of resources. Nothing comes back from there. Exactly right, the Grand Presider said and took a sip of red wine. The tart flavor exploded on his tongue. That is why this space station is here, to monitor out there, and to serve as a lookout, an early warning system in case anything comes back this way. Did something? The massive speaker asked. Yes, the Grand Presider said, and the guests hushed. They ceased chewing, sucking licking and absorbing those who used implements dropped them with a clatter to their bowls and plates and cups we managed to draw back one of your ships what was left of it our scientists have experimented for a very long time with reverse gravitonic attraction blank stares met him sorry it was in the brief but who reads those he shrugged off the rhetorical question basically everything has gravity but the greater mass will always draw the smaller, 
and with force in proportion to its density, a higher gravity pulls harder than a weaker. The idea was to use electron spin resonance to create high-density substances remotely to pull ships forward, then dismantle the substance and reassemble it ahead, thus creating a form of what we call pull-pulsion. And because electron spin can impact molecular assembly even from a great distance with a very low energy cost, it's as close to perpetual energy as we're currently able to get. The drawback, of course, is that gravity affects everything, so it has to be done quickly with rapid navigation controls. He waved his hands and shook his head. Forget it. I'm rambling. He sighed. Forgive me, the point is that we've been experimenting with this passive energy of gravity-based propulsion for some time along with some of our closest allies, meaning the ones who have actually chosen to put funding into the Galactic Science Commission. He let that hang while some of those at the table mentally began wondering how much they should reallocate out of their budgets. And during one of the test runs out into the void, the propulsion system made a mistake and created neutronium. We fixed the problem, and the neutronium was destroyed before it could wreak any localized havoc. A quantity fit to cap my finger could destroy a planet in the wrong spot. But when they got to the area they were being pulled toward, they found one of your old ships, Speaker. The massive looked down at the human and leaned forward. Name the vessel. I will tell you what I can, War Ape. XGO24601, the Grand Presider replied. The massive speaker pulled up the virtual console tied to his homeworld and began to type on keys nobody could see. A moment later, he was addressing the human. A prison ship, 600 of your years ago, one of our early attempts at entering the void. The crew was dead, but more notably large parts of the ship were, how should I put this, fossilized, I suppose. Or, how did the eggheads put it? He cleared his throat. The structure of the ship was encased in so much accumulated space dust and debris that the ship itself was rendered unnoticable to the naked eye until it crashed into something that knocked some of the material loose. Our ship was buried in space? The massive speaker asked. The Grand Presider nodded. Yes, more or less. If, as you say, it was only 600 of our years ago, there's no way it could have happened so quickly, not by any known means. According to one scientist, if it hadn't been pulled free of wherever it was, given a few thousand more years, it might have become a small moon. So either there is an unknown natural phenomenon out there, the likes of which we've never even put on the drawing board, or some intelligent species is playing around with time itself. I called you all here because you each have either first-hand knowledge of the void, or you have colonies on the outskirts along with us. You have a vested interest in this beyond the rest of the galactic hegemony. You'll be given all the information we have, and then in a few days we'll decide how we proceed. Grand Presider Anderson took a bite out of his steak again and noticed his plate had become tragically empty. Weaponizing time is actually a pretty good idea. If it can be done, the rest of them are probably thinking the exact same thing I am, I suppose, and can't wait to learn what's out there. He thought and put a smile on his face as he reached out for his cup to finish the last of his wine. I need a translation for you done fucked up as soon as possible, Admiral Istkan said. As the ninth admiral of the outermost system of the Xlakta hegemony, he followed his protocols to the letter. When coming across a new race that has yet to offer resources to the homeworld, destroy the outermost colony of the offender, and offer their authorities the chance to submit after a display of might. In this case, it was a small colony belonging to a bipedal species that identified itself as Homo sapiens on first contact before his salvo obliterated them. You done fucked up was their last transmission to him before his second salvo killed what was left. The colony was an isolated one near very rare, stable wormhole. The world was almost worthless. The only thing it had to offer was a superabundance of plant life. It was poor in minerals, small, and had no worthwhile animal life. More importantly, probes sent through the wormhole reported nothing for hundreds of light years, not even a space station. They were still reporting nothing the day they disappeared and stopped transmitting. Sir, the antennae of his language expert wiggled a little as he spoke. The red carapace glinted in the faint glow of the lights. His mandibles clicked together as he spoke. 
There is no direct translation. At first glance, it seems they wanted to come up and have sex with us, but that can't be right. I believe that they were using sex as a metaphor for mistake, that we made a mistake of some sort. Could it be that they have already offered tribute to the homeworld? The Admiral ruled that out immediately. He read the reports thoroughly before every new encounter, and none of their ships had come out this way in years, let alone encountered this race. A funny-looking soft body like that one would have been remembered. I wonder how they survive. He dismissed the idle question and sent the transmission off to the homeworld. Per protocol, a science vessel would be dispatched to evaluate the remnants. Eastcon gave it no more thought for months until he received his courtesy copy of the report detailing the findings on the colony world he had obliterated. Self-repairing bodies, bones growing through their sound holes and stained with meat, muscle total pull capacity exceeding 17 tons if they could pull in the same direction, entertainment featuring primitive gods and demons, lots of violence, mildly interesting but no more noteworthy than any of the other subject species which must tribute the hegemony. Iskan gave it no more thought again for two more years until he turned on his view screen at his desk one day and saw the face of their emperor. Iskan, Fleet Admiral, you are the one who destroyed the bipedal colony of Homo sapiens two years and two months and six weeks ago? The emperor skipped all formality, a shocking departure from protocol, but he at least kept the ordering of events by timeline. I did, he answered, but he was cut off from anything more. They have responded. The emperor's antennae flitted about madly as the view changed. The wormhole was open again, and through it poured a sea of white ships, each of them dozens and dozens of times larger than his flagship. The transmission of the Homo sapiens came on screen. This is Admiral Triu, fleet commander for the Great Terran Amalgam. By order of the Interstellar Senate, the protected status of your empire is now forfeit. For centuries we have left you alone so that we would not impede your natural development. However, due to your wanton and unprovoked aggression, you are hereby ordered to stand down your fleet at once and offer surrender and begin negotiations for a peace settlement that will ensure this never happens again. This will, of course, include the liberation of all tribute states, which will be placed under the protection of the Terran Amalgam immediately. We who command a hundred systems are to be... Chistkin's words might not have been audible to the Terran, but they might as well have been. The Terran's face vanished and a map appeared on screen. For a moment, Emperor and Admiral alike swelled with pride as the map of their empire appeared so grand and glorious in its bright red shade. Then the tribute states, dozens of single worlds or small numbers of minor civilizations having two or three worlds or systems. But as the map zoomed out, it reached the wormhole. Then the view changed, and the Terran amalgam came into view. It grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, until it was a great mass of blue, an ocean to the hegemony's raindrop. Make your choice, hostiles, or we will make it for you. The admiral killed the transmission, and Istkan's antennae flailed about as he recalled the last transmission of the little colony. They were right, he thought, and from the way the emperor's antennae moved, he knew it too. With the recovery of the lost massive ship, the Mega Quadrant's contributions to the Scientific Research Division of the Hegemony was practically doubled almost overnight. Research into time manipulation began in earnest. The first devices were simple. They were spinning things, orbiting a small chamber, and at first there were differences of mere microseconds. Later, models included motion and efforts at manipulating light speed manipulation brought about differences of minutes. But the breakthrough came not from propulsion or motion studies, but rather from the study of black holes where the gravity of these collapsed stars slowed down time close to the event horizon while it went on normally around it. Unsurprising to the rest of the hegemony, Terran fanaticism and work obsession, the evident routine of one of the rare active hunting species to evolve intelligence, led the way. The scientists of other hegemony member species continued to expand as the Terran spear point forged ahead, like an arrow which was narrow at the tip and wider at the base, it pried into the flesh of ignorance and forced the universe to surrender up its secrets. And in this way, the truth was revealed. True to form, 
It was the Terran Grand Presider who made the announcement. Speaking into view screens that would be seen from one corner of the Mega Quadrant to the other, and to an audience of many member races which were present on the station where rule over their segment of the galaxy was emanated, high spirits were everywhere. At long last, the mystery of the barrier void was solved. A new frontier was to be opened for all. I won't bore you with a long-winded speech. The scientists who did their jobs did them well and have earned eternal fame in their fields, all to be remembered as they should be, for opening up to us the way forward into the grand unknown, like our many ancestors who first took all of us to space. To commemorate their work, all their names should be etched in stone monuments at every aerospace university in the hegemony. The Grand Presider couldn't hear the cheers of scientists from world to world, or see the shining eyes of the watching youth whose ambitions shifted unexpectedly in one moment. The answer to the barrier void does lie in the manipulation of time. Just as we have manipulated space, some race unknown yet in time so ancient, we doubt that any of our species were even single-celled organisms yet, learned to manipulate time itself in order to travel. According to the scientists, the barrier void is was not created by any willful intent, or not likely. Instead, it appears that these ancient space mariners created this problem by accident, or accidental intent. Theoretically speaking, if they attempted to manipulate time in the wrong way, the fabric of time within space-time could be warped to a permanent acceleration, making crossing it an arduous and even impossible task. Since our existing warp drives are trying to warp space-time, and the time itself is already warped, failure was inevitable. As he explained, a pin dropping could have been heard in any watching room in the known universe, the energy built in every living body capable of it, as they waited with bated breath for the grand reveal. Now that we know what the problem is, we also have two solutions. Generational ships, what we once called Dyson spheres, built on the model of the massives, but vastly larger. These entirely self-sustaining vessels will house generational clones, which will replace one another as they die, along with a robotic crew to aid them, and they will establish warp conduits powered by energy siphoned from stars that will let us cut through from point to point, modifying our propulsion warp technology. Probes measuring chrono-warp levels indicate that the Great Barrier is 30 million light-years across, so if we all work together as one, we can carve a northwest passage through the void in only one generation, then we can see what's on the other side. The cheer that went up kept doctors of many races busy for weeks, healing the injured ears or other sound receptors on those who were not prepared for that level of noise. The vote was unanimous as the project was laid out. Even reticent peoples were enthusiastic in their contributions, and the Dyson Sphere development crews had no shortage of support, from everything from the Zalia voice to even Pankin protectorates. And volunteers for the voyages lined up for a shot at immortal fame as the first to cross the void and establish the conduit waypoints. But among the many who were enthusiastic, there were some doubting voices. What if whatever is on the other side is hostile? What if this accident was done intentionally to isolate something on the other side? What if there are other powerful empires that we can't even imagine? The questions made the rounds and became a more formal debate which ran throughout the construction of the spheres. There wasn't an obvious answer to that except, we try to establish peaceful relations and prepare to shut the conduit down if the threat is too great. But even the doubters wanted the project to go forward, resulting in a compromise in the form of an automated fleet that would establish first contact with anyone on the other side and learn what was really out there. And most dismissed their own concerns when precautions were made, saying in their heart of hearts, would anyone really just attack a group who crossed the barrier void just like that just for showing up? No, of course not. Nobody would be so daft and war crazy.